Greetings. Happy Sunday to y'all. What's happening, folks? Take a sip here. Wake up. Ah, oh, delicious. Good morning. Ah. Ah. I don't know what to say. I'm speechless for a change. I, I'm especially speechless because there's a big old super chat that came in before I even got here. Thank you very much. Let's see who that is. It's Phil. Thank you, Phil. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate that. Let's see here. Let's get started right away. First of all, okay, let's do the, do, do some business first. So I should be being joined in about uh, half an hour by Mr. Richard Fortas. I, I do believe if everything goes as planned. And uh, we'll have a, a good discussion. We've never never actually met or, or spoken, um, but I've followed him on his social medias and stuff for quite a, quite a while. And then I saw him on uh, Tone Talk with uh, Dave and Mark, and it was great. And so I was like, this seems like a great guy. I just really want to talk with him. And um, so anyways, this will be the first time that, that we've all met. Uh, so it should be really good. And uh, yeah, his if you don't follow him on Instagram and whatnot yet, you should because he's always putting up great guitar-related content. And cool, you know, he's a geek like like all of us. I think he's a guitar geek. He's got he's got lots of interests. And in. I want to talk to him a little bit today about how varied uh, both his interests in you know musically as well as in guitars and amplifiers and you know because he's so, one second you'll see him with a cool you know, Les Paul and the next it's a Gretsch. And, and then he was talking about his affinity for tweed amps, which I found really interesting because he also really digs the whole obviously modded Jose Marshall thing and stuff. So I, I think it's going to be a great discussion. Um, okay. So having said that, and I've got another special guest uh, to announce, but I'll do that later on. Um, and uh, it's one folks have been asking for. So I'm, I'm excited about that as well. Uh, Phil says, with his super chat, which is just too kind. Thanks, Phil. He says, my sushi buddy, great interview with Rhett. Thanks. Yeah, that was fun, actually. And that was the first time we'd ever really spoken. The The interview I did with Rhett for his, I think it's his second channel. Rhett Schull Studio, he calls it or something, I think. Um, anyways, I really enjoyed that chat. Uh, you're saying you put the Wampler Plexi Deluxe in the Dry Bell Unit 67 on your board due to uh, the reviews. Vid vids I made. Thanks, man. Use them uh, with your Les Paul for a Rhett song challenge. He commented, that's one of the best, if not the best DI tone I've ever heard. That's awesome. That's cool. How did you How did you record it? I wonder. Like, did you do it? When you say a DI tone, did you uh, use speaker simulation or something out of your pedal board? I wonder. And uh, thanks again, man. And we've got Michael there in the super chat as well. And uh, he says, thank you, Michael. He says, hello from Hamilton, Ontario. I, I've got, a, I had a memory of Hamilton all of a sudden come back to me, playing there with Don Hanley years ago. And uh, somebody in the crowd saying, we, the set was very front loaded with some covers and some themed songs and things. <laughs> I remember that on that particular tour. And not a lot of songs that maybe people knew uh from him you know i mean we played spell on you i think first we opened with that and then we went into you know a leonard i think there was a leonard cohen cover in there and a couple others and it was kind of you know it was a theme set for fall is what it was and so by about the sixth tune in this guy in the crowd it's he just i remember shouting out between songs he said play a song we fucking know hey eh? very canadian hamilton and the next song on the set list was um Heart of the matter, and so Don goes, "Here you go, dickhead." <laughs> I could barely play the intro. Jang, 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 jang. Trying to like laugh through the chords, <laughs> not screw up. <laughs> Here you go, dickhead. It was awesome. Oh god. Anyways, uh, watched you on the classic rock show last night. That's right. They had a live stream of the. Uh, the two shows that we did right before lockdown, hence the title live before lockdown. And, uh, they, on Friday did set one Saturday, they played set two and it was fun actually to hang in the chat and stuff. And I was, I was hanging out for the live stream and talking with people and stuff. And it was, it was fun and fun to watch again. Uh, 
Michael says, thanks um, for bringing back uh, concerts in our life. Yeah, man, you bet. You bet. I can't take credit. They did that. And I was just happy to see that they, they played the shows. But uh, it was fun. Fun to be there. And we'll, we'll do that again. One day soon, I hope. One day soon. One day soon. Manuel's here from Madrid. He says, hi from Madrid. What's up? I love that city. I haven't been there for a long time. Man, it's been 15 years or maybe longer. It's a great city. Really great city. Uh, Ian says, I saw the original uh, Sanzamp is getting reissued. Really? In pedal format? It would be nice. Neat to hear it compared to modern DI systems. I always thought those things sounded really good. I, I remember the first band I was in in L.A., the other guitar player used to play one of those Sanzamp pedals, excuse me, through a... Um, through a high watt that set clean and it sounded great. He had a really cool tone and just set the amp clean, you know, very, I guess, Gilmore style. Jeez, you guys are coming in hard and fast with the super chats here. Um, yeah, I would love to try that as well and see how it would be cool actually to make a video. Maybe I'll hit them up because I know the Tech 21 people have made videos for them. It'd be cool to, you know, to revisit it and stuff. And and uh, it was always the, it was the original analog amp sim, you know? Pretty cool. Uh, I mean, it came after the the Rockman, I guess. If we count, is Rockman digital or is Rockman analog? I don't know. Actually, I have no idea. Partially a little bit of both. Paul says, uh, "What's my view on solderless 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 leads? Solderless leads on pedal boards? I'm not really a fan, and that's just because I talk to a lot of pedal board guys." Uh, Phil says that, uh, by the way, just back, uh, backing up to his, uh, my question for him, he says he went from the pedal board right into his interface. No speakers or emulation. Wow. Interesting. He must've turned the tone control way down on the drive, huh? And gotten a decent, decent tone that way. I'll have to check that out. I want to hear that. How can I hear that? Very interesting. Um, yeah. Anyways, I would like to try that. Sans amp pedal. Sans amp. Is it sans amp or sans amp? Sans amp. Like if I was saying sans, sans, you know, I went running outside, sans my clothes. No, I don't know. Hopefully that doesn't happen. San, would I say sans or sans? Sans amp, sans amp. What do you guys say? I know. Every time I say it, I've got anxiety about it since the 90s. Uh, Paul Pavitt says, have you kept your Ibanez destroyer copy stock? Yes, that guitar is stock 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 and shall remain that way i think because it sounds ferocious and feels so good i don't i don't even want to play with it you know we might put the super 70s in it because you know the pickups were replaced at some point but they sound so good what's in the guitar that i don't really want to mess with it that much but i'll listen to the originals sure uh and try that <clears throat> when we do this pickup video i'm waiting for the guitar still for this i know i say this all the time but we're gonna make this van here i'm sitting the pickups are staring at me Right now, I feel like they're staring at me, sitting there waiting to be put in the guitar. Uh, but I've got a huge collection of pickups now from Re from Rewind, Pariah, Seymour Duncan, uh, DiMarzio, Mighty Might, Motor City. Um, just I don't even know how we're going to do it. It's going to be a it's going to be crazy putting all those pickups in a guitar and trying them all. <laughs> what was I thinking? But it's going to be cool. Uh, Tony says, happy Sunday, Pete. When Richard shows up, can you ask him his opinion on finger exercises and if he used any particular to get better finger independence? Same question goes for you. Sure. I'll add that right now or uh, I'll forget. Uh, let me add it to my list here. A viewer was asking for finger independence. Exercises. Jeez, I'm a little slow today. Accept uses instead of exercises. That's great. This is when I use Siri. Exercises. Well, got that done. Okay. Uh, Arthur's up there as well saying, <clears throat> looking forward to this chat, just showing support. Your destroyer sounds so killer. Your last video was awesome. Thank you. All you guys in the top chat. Thank you. Top chat, super chat. 
Mark on Tone Talk was saying, I like when Pete says top chat. <laughs> the top chat. You're all in the top chat. We're all top chatters here today. Uh, Todd Roy is saying, ask Richard about uh, the Mick Mars Marshall. <clears throat> I believe that's the, uh, <clears throat> I believe that's the, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the, the Jose modded one that he bought. And I will. And he says, yes, you are announcing Rishi Kotzen. Great. Okay, so I am announcing Richie Kotzen, actually. He's going to be on the show. Um, <laughs> in, in, uh, I'll just say it now since you brought it up. Uh, I, it's in a couple weeks. So two weeks from today, Richie's going to do the show. So it'll be great to see him. He's got a new record out with uh, Adrian Smith from uh, Iron Maiden, of Iron Maiden fame. Single's great. Very bluesy. Adrian sings great on it. And they're you know t uh, trading off on vocals and lead vocals. And it's really cool. So if you haven't checked it out, be sure and check out Richie Kotzen's new new single, new project with with Adrian. But we'll talk about that and many other things. I think he's a great guy. We had a long talk on the phone the other day, and it was it was really good. So um, anyway, Richie Kotzen in two weeks. So it's a it's a big month for for guests. Now I better just check my check my mail here because I checked in with. I say that, and then I, I'm just, I'm checking in to see here. For, oh, there's. Yeah, Richard just got back to me and said, I'll see you soon. So he should be joining us in the stream soon. I realized this morning that we hadn't actually checked in, but he seems like a very, you know, like like he's super on it and everything. So I was like, oh, it'll be fine. And then I was like, I hope you remember. <laughs> but I think it's all going to be good. Looks like it. So uh, Phil says, I'll send you that song through your, your website. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'd love to hear that track uh, that you played direct on. We've got so many folks here already. 400 people. Great to see you all. And uh, let's see. Let me back up in the chat and see if I missed any uh, any questioned, questions here. Uh, what did we do this week around here? I did the Speaker Mix Pro video. Did anybody see that for the, um, the Celestian plug-in, uh, which is a lot of fun, especially if you want to get some aux-like capabilities and add them to something like the Sur Reactive Load. It's got its built-in Z-curve thing that I understand a little bit better now than when I did the video. Uh, the Z-curve thing allows you to essentially add like impedance curve style, you know, thing to impedance curve style thing <laughs> to, to the to the sound. So if you're using something like a hot plate or maybe a air brake, like a resistive load, essentially a resistor, um, you can get more of that reactive thing. Now, I still have yet to test it. I actually want to pull out a, a, a resistor and you know, try a try, try it and actually compare it directly AB it with the reactive load and see because that'll be interesting to, if, to hear how close it comes to something like the reactive load uh, and if it if it gets you there, um, you know, be an interesting thing. So I'm going to check that out. What else did I do this week? The video for the of course the Rats Bane. That's right that I used the destroyer on. Uh, it's a great little pedal. Here it is, right here. I really like it. I especially like the low gain sounds. If you, uh, you know, watch the video, you'll remember I was saying there's a three position gain switch. Uh, and in the lowest gain setting with the drive or distortion, I should say, around nine o'clock, you can get some very amp like, martially kind of aggressive rock tones that are pretty damn cool, I think. So I, I like this pedal a lot. If, if you want a high gain distortion that borders on fuzz, uh, somebody was saying it's not a fuzz; it's a distortion. I was like, I don't know, man. I, I just go by what it sounds like, not by what whatever any kind of technical. I mean, it sounds like a fuzz. <laughs> it gets really fuzzy when you when you have it in the higher gain positions, which is cool. It's kind of like a it's 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 uh it's not like a muff. It's still got more of a distortion quality to it, but it definitely you know loses articulation and has that soft attack like a fuzz does when it when it gets into the the nether regions of gain, as we say. Uh, ha ha. Okay. What else? What else? What else? Uh, just looking through all the all your all your comments here. And great to have you all here. What have we got? Four hundred forty people online. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> what else happened around here this week? I'm working on a video for a really wild reverb pedal that's right behind me, but I can't show it to you because it's coming out tomorrow. So that's happening. For those of you that are Sonic Adventurer types, it's a great pedal. Um, anything else to report? I don't know. It'll come to me. Lots of videos coming. Lots of stuff coming. 
I think it leaked already that Eventide's doing a small version of their micro pitch. So I could say that because it, I saw it on the internet the other day and then everything was pulled down, but people found out about it anyway. So uh, there'll be a video coming for that uh, soon. Um, they're doing an interesting thing, releasing a lot of the kind of the individual H9 algorithms in individual pedal format, which which I find interesting because it seems I like it. And then one part of me is like, but you already have that in your H9. And then the other part of me is like, yeah, but it's cool to have in a single pedal because it's such a thing like the micro pitch algorithm. If you want that thing, it's cool to have. And just to, how do you guys feel about that? I don't know. I mean, it, you can have it all in the H9 or you can get the single pedal that it, but I still like it. Like, I don't think, I think it's, I think it's a, a cool thing to do. The black hole one, for instance, you know, if, if your penchant, you know, your, your reverb uh, desires trend towards, you know, the ambient, maybe that's all you need, you know, is, is the black hole pedal instead of, you know, an H9 that does 4 million things. And, and it's nice to just have the knobs. Ben says he likes the single pedal idea. Uh, John says your audience is growing. Awesome. Yeah, it's been, I mean, really consistently good here the last, uh, you know, month or two has been like the videos always get 8,500 views, you know, or maybe up to 10,000, at least like 8,500 uh, with the folks watching the live stream afterwards and stuff. And we always seem to get up above 600 people, which is really amazing. So, and I really look forward to it every week. I do. Uh, John is just asking, just seeing his question here. He's asking, oh. There's Paul saying the separate pedal idea is a good one. I agree. Uh, John, there's John's uh, question. He says, got the Sir Reactive Load IR. Any advice for other IRs to try? Um, you know, the other day I landed on uh, the Celestion uh, G12H75 cream back in the Sir 212 closed back cabinet, which is my PT signature cabinet for the original PT 100 head. Uh, and I landed on that and I didn't know what it was. I've got it in the re reactive load up there and I, I didn't, I didn't know what was in that bank. I had to plug in the reactive load and actually look at the files to see, cause it sounded so good. And I was like, Oh, it's that, it's that one, which is really great. You know? Uh, so I love that one. Uh, Red Rover is just saying he's got a, just before this chat disappears here, I'll come back to that about the IRs, uh, have a rat's bane in my basket ready to pull the trigger. One question, is it noisy? Uh, not really. Actually, somebody commented on how little noise there was in my video, and I might have used a gate in that part, but the pedal doesn't seem to, I wouldn't say it's exceptionally noisy any more than any other, you know, seems, seems fine. I wouldn't worry about that. Go for it. It's a cool pedal. Um, so anyways, the, okay, so the, the uh, 212 closed back Sir G12H75 cream back IRs from Celestion. Really like those. Like across the board, that's just a great sound. It's the same thing I felt when I tried that speaker in the cabinet when we were, when we were making those cabinets and coming up with what speaker combo we were going to use. We tried all these different combos, and the best sounding one was just two cream back H speakers. It sounded great. Balance from clean to dirty. Just with this overall, my, my impression of it was there was no like, no like spiky this or bloated that, or it was just this even sound that sounded like very finished and good. So try that. Um, really like it. Um, anything else? Let me think. I, I, I was never the biggest Creamback M fan um, because that speaker to me sounds really quite midi, even compared to a greenback, but the IRs sound really good. So just the standard Celestion 412 Creamback M, you know, try the 121 and 57 blend, I guess, and see what you think of that. And it sounds really good to me, like for a greenback tone. So uh, those are good ones. Um, try, try those and see what you think. Having said that, I'm not sure what comes in the Sir Reactive Load. It might already come with the H's now that I'm thinking about it. I just can't remember. I know in my PT-15 it does, but the, the IR complement, you know, it might not. The IR complement in the Reactive Load is different than the PT-15 because I came up with the the IRs in the, in the PT-15, the, the, you know, the order of them and all that and which ones to include. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. 
Let's see here. Farid is getting a freakout pedal. One of my favorites. So useful. Uh, Sergio says the Wampler Rat is so versatile. Watch your video as well as Wamplers. It is uh, really versatile. You know, for if you need distortion through fuzz, great. Somebody said in the comments, they said the only thing is its greatest strength is its drawback. It's generic sounding. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess anything in that kind of martially vein could be, you know, in the lower gain thing could be deemed as being generic. But um, I don't find it really generic sounding. <clears throat> sounding. God, I don't know what's the matter with me today. I think it's allergies. I, I woke up and took an Allegra at like 6 a.m. because I was just like, you know, and uh, that's what's going on. Always in L.A. when it warms up and you get allergies. I see Richard has just joined in the, uh, he's, I've got to put him in the stream here in just a second there, but there he is. He's, he's on deck and ready to go. And it's 1156. So let's, uh, I'll take just another quick question here from the, the top chat and then we'll add, we'll add Richard and say hello. Uh, John says, is that even tied pedal, the EVH detune thing? Yeah, exactly. It's a micro pitch pedal. So in a single pedal, um, you know, with the, you can do plus nine, minus nine stereo, all that good stuff. And so that's, that's coming. Uh, and then Langer one, two, three, four is up there and says, uh, for Dennis, who apparently bought too many pedals recently, and so can't talk chat. <laughs> it's the gear acquisition syndrome. That's what it is. We all have this. Okay, let's add Richard and say hello. Hey, man, can you hear me? Hey, I can. How are you? How are you doing? What I'm a pleasure. Really happy to be here. Man, this is fantastic. Like, I've wanted to talk with you for the longest time. Me too. I have so many questions I want to ask you. Me too. And I wrote them all down. <laughs> so. Otherwise, oh, I would you wrote them. yours down? That's I did, cheating. but... I try and be somewhat prepared. So, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, are you, I, I, I got to ask you right out of the gate, are you in LA or did you, do you live no. elsewhere? Yeah. Um, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. That's what I thought. Which is yeah. why I okay. wore the shirt. <laughs> oh. <laughs> not to be Amazing. political, not to be political or anything, but fuck Josh Hawley. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, God. That's fantastic. Uh, so uh, I know yeah, Canadian, I, I, so you you you're trying to be neutral, but <laughs> I don't. I you know, folks that know me know most of my social media. I don't, and then there's one avenue where I go full out, you know. But it's mm -hmm. like, but yeah, I, I I try I try not. You're 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 allowed though, because you you get the pass because you're here on on my show and you're the guest. So it's like, it's and I live in St. Louis, so I live in Missouri, so I feel right. like I have every right to uh, absolutely to say fuck Josh Holly. That you're 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 an American citizen with a vote and a voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You you were born there though, right? In St. Louis. I was. Yeah. So I grew up here and then left as soon as I possibly could, hmm. and then moved back because I'm you know. <laughs> Isn't that interesting though? I find that really interesting. Uh, tell me a little bit about that because when I go back okay. to my hometown, it's got this pull for me too. I don't know if I could live in my hometown because of the weather. It's so cold, Edmonton, Canada. But right. I, it, it'll always be home, and I'll always love it. Um. Okay. So I, I, I never thought I would move back here. I really didn't. I, hmm. uh, I'm, you know, I lived in New York for most of my life, and I have. Okay. And I actually just sold my apartment there. Um, but I moved from New York, and then I lived in LA for a little while. Yeah. Um, and I. I bought the house that I grew up in, in wow. St. Louis, because my, my mother told me that, uh, that it was for sale. And <laughs> I was, at the time my father was sick and I wanted to be able to come back and visit and bring my family. And hmm. so that the house came up for sale and I bought, the, I, it was super cheap and yeah. So that's fascinating. I, yeah. And I bought it just to have a place because I bought it cash from the bank because I thought that, uh, you know, I thought that it would be, I thought we, you know, we'd have some place to come visit my, my parents and, um, and we ended up, the kids loved it. And I, I really didn't want my kids to grow up in LA. Um, yeah. a lot of my friends, kids grew up in LA and, you know, had struggles and stuff like that. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, I feel like there's little pockets of LA where you can go, but it's always, you know, you, you got to move to, you know, Sierra Madre or you move to Claremont or you go way out right. west to the, you yeah. know, to, you know, that part of the valley or whatever. But, um, yeah, that's I interesting. In, I was actually in Woodland Hills, which was, was oh. nice. I mean, it was far enough away, you know, but, but still it just, yeah. I mean, the struggles with schools and stuff like that. And I didn't, yeah, I, didn't, it makes I remember, I remember walking my daughter to school and she was maybe four. It was like preschool, three or four. And she said to me, we're walking to school. And she said, looked up, am, am I as fat as that girl? Uh, and I was like, oh, God, we got to get out of here. <laughs> that yeah. was the moment. Interesting. That, it was a very, yeah, it was a funny moment for me. You know, but. So what's that feel like? Because, I mean, this is the house where you grew up or probably started playing guitar. and uh, it, Yeah. Well, I mean, completely, I gutted it. It was a mess when I got it. And yeah. uh, so gutted it and redid the whole thing. But uh, yeah. it's in. I didn't intend to stay here. I mean, mm. you know, I, I thought that we would, and we just, it's comfortable. I don't really need something bigger. You know, mm. I've, right. I've got my little, it'd be nice to have a bigger studio. You know, it'd, studio. Be nice, yeah. it'd be nice to have like a guest house, right? You know, where I could, I, you don't have kids. Um, no, I don't. No. But it would be really nice to leave my house and go to work you know right. every morning and, and i mean this which uh, unfortunately i have to do that a lot anyways right you know the tour but but being home for the last year which has been incredible for me to be honest i mean i, I feel a little guilty saying that but sure being with my family at this time in my daughter's lives because they're teenagers now they're both newly <laughs> two teenagers so it, it was really great for me to be home during this time yeah so I, but to leave and go to my studio in like in another building would be awesome even if it was like the backyard where you had a guest even house. If it, yeah 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 sure i totally get that what's your setup now did you build like a bedroom kind of setup or something or? yeah yeah okay. um i've just got a small room which is like my control room and i've got like another live room where my amps are so you do you still do live amps and cabs and stuff in there though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually something I want to talk to you about. So okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I love let's... your setup. Um oh, cool. Thank you. And I know you redid it like uh, a couple years ago, is that right? Yeah. Uh I think it's been two I don't know if it's been two and a half years now, something like that. Um, I remember when you were doing it. Yeah. Because I stalk you on the on the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm feel on. Like, I feel like you're my you you like the, my best friend that I've never met. Uh. <laughs> well, that's insane. You know, when I saw you on Tone Talk, I was like, we've got to hang out. We got to talk and stuff because you just I don't know. You just come off so um, well. There's a there's a lot of things I want to ask you about. I mean, you started on violin, I think, which I did too, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, oh, is that right? Do I did. Yeah. I don't, which um, I still have it, though. I have my violin. And the last time I went to play, I opened up the case and I looked at it and the bow, all the horsehair had shredded somehow. On the, yeah. So I was like, I was like, like literally like geared up. Okay, I'm going to open it. I'm going to pick this thing up and play today. And I opened up the case and I was like, guess not. <laughs> and that might have been seven years ago. <laughs> okay. And so you close so, the case. <laughs> yeah. So I need so, a bow. But uh, yeah. uh, man, you know, I really have. Uh, dug back into my whole orchestral roots you know amazing. and uh during covid so that's been my project and okay. uh i'm really digging into a, a composition orchestral composition and doing arrangements and stuff like that doing string arrangements working wow. with um different libraries you know um so working with you know Composing on the computer and stuff like that, as well as tracking live strings, you know, on top of that. Uh, so I also cool. play cello too. So yeah. it, it's been really great. This year has been great for that. And I feel like I've really progressed yeah, and I done guess, something with my time. I, I, I relate to your like 
saying like, I almost feel guilty. And I think a lot of people feel this way because we know there's been a lot of people like suffering this year, but there's, there's been, mm. good, and I think a lot of people have this, where it's like a lot of, good, even folks that are maybe financially not well off or things, it's like, well, but I did get to spend a lot of time with my family and those types, or maybe working on a new skill or practicing yeah. well, or, you know, it, yeah. writing. Man, it's been great to dig into doing sessions again, to be able to, you know, and I've been really lucky that I've had work coming in steadily and uh, including string arrangements and stuff like that, which has been so much fun to really dig my teeth into. And, uh, you know, getting, being able, okay, being able to use the gear I've been acquiring for the last 20 years on the road, right? To really, <clears throat> to really dig in and be able to um, explore different amplifiers, different miking techniques, different preamps, different, you know, really, I, I love that. I love yeah. that. I've, you know, dialing in tones, but where I really, I have so much respect for what you do because you're, it seems like your workflow is so streamlined. Ah, uh, it's, I'm a little chaotic, but I did get a good scene going for being, for, uh, being able to get an idea going quick mm -hmm. as, as far as just setting up a template. And I recommend this to anybody out there that does recording, like have a template and logic with everything already, you know, your drum programs in there and everything ready to go so that within minutes you can be tracking, you know, like yeah. you get an idea and you're laying it down and everything's routed. And Yeah. Know. I got in for sessions, you know, that's a, a different template. And then for orchestral stuff, it's a different template, but yeah, I, I have that. That's Definitely. Good. But it seems like you've got, okay. So you've got all your, your heads there right and they're yes. all patched in and you how do you do that so basically um because i have a fear of commitment just yeah okay <laughs> well it's it's nice because you don't actually have to commit because you've got everything ready to go and then you can just make your choices on the fly which is so uh, i use but the i've MP. got way too much stuff to have everything ready to go oh yeah well i mean <laughs> you can always expand you could literally have 16 amps i think you know ready to go okay all right now yeah. we're talking and then you use this thing. This is the remote for the MP. So literally, like you type in cab one and head fifteen or whatever you want, you know. And literally, so it's like on this thing. Use this cable here. On this thing, you just type. Here's you can have two cabinets going, and you can have a an amp that you select. So it's like, okay, what do I want to use? I've only got three cabs. I've got a Marshall that's mic'd up in the other room, and then I've got my aux and my Sur Reactive load. So okay. I'll, I'll type in zero one cab one. That's the reactive load. I'll go zero two cab one. That's the aux or zero three. That's my cab. And then I just type in the the, the amp. I want my Princeton so reverb. You, I go zero eight. Boom. Then so I'm you've on only that. got one cab mic up in the other room. Right now, yeah, I only have one. I'd love to have another one, and I have the ability to do that, but it means the pain in the ass of running two two eighty foot more mic lines out there and doing all that and i just haven't got okay to so it. you don't have a you don't have wall panels and no i've literally okay. have hardwired through a hole through a port in my roof like the, the mic cables coming down they go all the way over to the other room and i just run them in there and that okay. room i originally intended to do that i mean with proper panels and actually build mm -hmm. it out it just never happened it, one thing kind of led to another and i never finished that room but i've got this the room is isolated and has a door on it anyway and then I, i've got mm -hmm. this thing from uh, the company Clear Sonic, same people that make those panels like Bonamassa uses to put in yep. front of his cabs. And mm -hmm. I've got this Clear Sonic amp pack thing, which is just like these baffles basically that go around the cab and it drops the volume by like half. It's kind of amazing. So the cab's in there and baffled and everything, and it's just way over in the, and I can't even barely even hear it in here. I mean, okay. So. Do you ever run the ox and the cab at the same time? Not really. So do, you, do you take it? I'll use IRs as well as I always have a live cab or a live okay. amp because I'm, I have a tweed bench. So I have all my tweeds in the other room mm -hmm. and I, you know, I pick the one I want to use for whatever track. And then I'll use that in combination with, I'll run the cable out and back from the amp. So I'm running to those speakers, even in a combo, you know, and then I, I take the combination and then I'll use the IRs as well. So I'll have two mics and two IRs or two, uh, you know, lines from the aux. Okay. And then I combine them, you know, if, but you, you have to time correct them. 
Right. That's what I was going to say. Do you, yeah. you, you probably got, or you got a, a millisecond and a half or something where you need to. I do it by eye. I correct hmm. every track after. And then does it sound cool once you phase correct? Sounds okay. great. Sounds yeah. like I love it because it, it just gives you something, you know, it's a different flavor. It's like having two cabs mic'd up all the time. There's a, uh, and you can run a 412 and a 212, you know, depending on what, like I always go with something yeah. else to balance what I have live. I was just thinking like you could probably even in your template, just have that plug-in delay set on the track with the, right. Once you figured out what the value is and then, then there it is, right. Yeah. Whenever. Yeah. yeah. You're right. You're right. I, yeah. I'm, it's interesting. Yeah. I just, I select everything and then I it. I did a video this week for the, uh, Celestion plugin, um, which yeah, is their... I saw that you were going to be doing that. Yeah, and we it's, talked it's... about it last week, right? And it's 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 pretty great um, for those out there that don't have an aux and want to get some of like the room mics and stuff. It's exceptional. It's like being able to get room mics on. I mean, in a, in a, when you're recording at home and without a proper mm -hmm. room, like who can do that? So it sounds so real. It's just fantastic for for anybody that feels like oh, IRs they don't sound real or directory. Oh, I got a mic a cab or I don't get. It's like Man, when when you hear the celestians in the rooms, it's interesting because I've actually been to the studio where they do the the, the celestian IR. So I've been in the mm -hmm. room and seen the great room where they, it's a place called Decoy in the UK, outside of London, a little ways. And um, it's just really interesting how that whole process, how they make those. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a great plug-in for those that don't have the aux, you know. And and I guess the the terrific thing about it is it's an IR loader. It's a, it's not a closed system like the aux is. I love the aux, but it's quite a, you know, you're, those are the cabs that you got to work with and stuff. The ones that are right. There. Right. Well, Which, it's an IR loader it, like for, for me, I'm always using a combination. So it's like, I never use the aux just by itself. Um, I mean, you could, because okay. it sounds fantastic. It's the best one I've heard, like out of all the different cab mods, I've heard modules that I've heard. That's the one that I'm really, yeah. Plus it feels effects. real to me. Feels real, yeah. Yeah, it, and and they they've got the eleven seventy six and the great plate reverb in there and all that cool stuff. That's fun mm -hmm. to use. So they're, they're, I mean, and the, yeah, and the delay. And it's nice to be able delay. to it, to be able to drop the load on the speaker so it's a little quieter. You know, when I'm miking. Right, it works well. It's a good it's a good unit. Yeah. What do you think of those pedals they came out with the UA pedals? Like, well, James hasn't sent me one yet, <laughs> <laughs> but they look great. They look great, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm so happy for him because the buzz on them has been great. Have you do you have them? I don't. And uh, they said as soon as we get some samples. Yeah, they we told can... me that too. I feel much better <laughs> if you didn't. <laughs> yeah, we're in the same boat. I know. I, I feel like lighting up on him now. Totally, because there's some guys I'm that have them. Really I'm like, Why are you about sending it? to that guy? <laughs> right. That's that's my line. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I like I saw Josh Smith using him. He sounded great with him, but he's he said and he's that guy pretty... sounds great all the time. I hate True. that guy. He can play anything. I, I, yeah. Yeah, he's just ridiculous. He's yeah. so good. It's so good. Yeah, he's and one of my favorite players. Is he? Yeah, yeah. You pick up yeah, his guitar 13. and it's like, yeah, it's just like okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he's the sweetest dude. So so great. Um. God, I've got so much stuff I want to ask you about, but I know we could probably just go on like this for a couple of hours easily, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Doug's there in the super chat. He says, you're my two favorite people to listen to talk to about guitar gear. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's cool. Yeah, and he, he's talking about the uh, Bell Epoch. Is that how you say that? The Because uh, uh, mm -hmm. you, you rave about them. Is that the, That's the delay from uh, Catlin Bread, right? From Catlin Bread. Yeah. Um, Is that I'm your a, favorite? a total EP3 nut. Oh, cool. Yeah, there's like know, something uh, magical about EP3s. Yeah, and that's the best. Have you played one? Yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah. I don't have one. It's one pedal I don't own, but I tried them out in when I was in Germany. I did a show on different tape delay pedals with Dan from the Gig Rig and mm -hmm. like a YouTube uh, video. So we did the L Cap and we did that one and something else. I can't remember what the other one was, but they that one sounded great. I mean, it's, it's definitely really good. And that's what they, Josh was actually raving about in the ua the new ua ep3 sim and the delay pedal is supposed to be great so josh smith was talking that's, about that's i know that jane you know james santiago yeah a little, a little bit yeah okay so yeah. he uh he i know he really worked hard on that and he's also ep3 nut so i'm sure it is like the best thing ever i'm really excited about those pedals in fact 
I'm waiting. Yeah. I'm building a board, and I'm waiting for those. <laughs> ah, that that's that cool. in a haze uh, sixty-seven. What's that? This mm -hmm. oh, I'm turning you on to something. This is awesome. Totally. It's a <laughs> uh, it's a fuzz um, by this company called Isle of Tone. Wow. Actually, Josh oh. Smith is where I first saw one, and I was like, "Oh my god, I have to find these." And, awesome. Um, yeah. So I'm waiting on that. Um, and I got the uh, uh, R2R. Is that right? What's Stuff? that one? The R2R Wa. Oh, okay. See, that's another R2, one I don't know about. <laughs> R2R Electronics. Have you seen their? Um, uh, they make a. Oh, actually, my thing's on it. Um, they make a a range master clone that is oh. ridiculous. It's so really? good. But they also make a a Italian Vox wall with a. Um, I need to know about that because I love range masters. Yeah, it, it's the okay. So I saw Bonamassa's and I was like, oh my god, that thing sounds amazing. Wow. Um. But yeah, so this is the oh, sorry, that's the wall. The and then it, there's a controller, right? A, oh, you know, a controller that plugs into it. So you pick a frequency. And, oh wow! Uh, yeah. Anyway, crazy. R R two R and the stuff is just top notch. It's so good. Italian company. No, no. Oh. The, it, it's based on an Italian box wall. You know, oh, Italian box. Yeah. And it's the first thing I've heard. The first wall I've heard that has that uh throatiness of a i used to have a box and a an italian box and it broke and i oh. i lost it somehow i don't know it, i've lost so much gear over the years <laughs> i know you ever go what happened to that thing like where, it, it, where it, yeah that? yeah i'm like that with clothes too i'll see i'll see myself at a gig like a photo from eight years ago and i'll go where did, and you're that like, where, where did that go yeah i know i too. love that shirt <laughs> oh you know what else i'm gonna put on my board because of you Ah, the freak out. Oh yeah, do you I dig? Still in the box. I have, um, but um, yeah, I saw that that was like your you you gave some tips on that one time, and I was like, I'm gonna get one of those. And it I, great. Uh, I'm the recording. It's so good. Yeah, I'm gonna put it on my uh, little studio board for in here. That I'm it's I'm waiting for the UA stuff. Super useful for uh, for recording when you can't have a cab in the room and. Um, you know, I'd always heard about interesting. I'd heard about Slash doing the Appetite record, having a little amp in the room that was like some little solid state combo or something. I, is how I always imagined it. But with the maybe it was a Mesa or something, but with the gain crank super uh, high, so that he could track in the control room and get before, feedback, yeah. which is neat. You know, it's a neat trick. But barring that, you know, this thing is like the, the freak out is the coolest. Um, I mean, it really works well when you're just trying to grab the last note of a solo and get it to sing or something and just take off and then you can right, right. on the console in the mix yeah. or something. But it's I'm just starting to get into it. So I'm but my goal yeah. is to put that on this little board. It's so cool. Uh, stuff gets here. It's cool building these boards like when you get inspired. I got those. I mean, these just deserve a pedal board. There's no way I can't not put these guys on a board because they're just cool as shit you know it's yeah like... see i don't have those <laughs> they're so good that's okay I know. you're you gotta I know. get these because the preamp in particular is it's basically an amp in a pedal it's that benson amp um right right with, you know and then it but it's got a fuzz circuit too so it does germanium silicon fuzz and all that and sounds amazing so that makes sense to have on a board doesn't it um oh hmm. man i mean it's big but it's like you, it literally would be three four pedals you could probably not have because you've got that right you know right so. and so what's up with the with the reverb it's basically a 224 lexicon now, uh, folks I, i'll just say there's so many super chats coming in and stuff i'm gonna go through everything here and i'll just back up through the chat and get to them all i promise but um i'm sorry i'm talking too uh, much aren't I? no you are not it's amazing it's perfect <laughs> that's what we're here for um but yeah it's a 224 lexicon which was like came out in 78 or 79 i think and yeah 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 uh, and it's you know wow. that sound i mean that early it's it, it's it does it to a t and kind of i think they even have gone beyond it with it, because that was a pretty lo-fi time for digital and converters mm -hmm. and things like that so you can get that sound but you can also do a higher uh, sort of a hi-fi version of that the demo you, sound oh. fantastic oh thanks man yeah it's um it's easy when the pedal's like that 
I mean, I you know, when you plug something in and it's just like, oh my God, this is inspiring. Yeah, you start yeah. playing. That's what that was like. So, and I, I'll say the preamp too. I really like this for, like, it's a bold move. They obviously made a lot of investment, um, you know, trying to get moving faders going and all that and fabricate all this stuff. And then the pedal's not cheap. It's they're some of the most expensive pedals out there. That's a bold thing to do, like to, to go, well, we're just going to go all in on this and, and, uh, you know, try and, cause a lot of people go the other way. Like their pedals were always kind of complex, the Chase Bless pedals. They could have gone like, well, we'll make a simple version or mini pedals. Cause that'll be, you know, less expensive right. and easy. And no, they went kind of the other way. We went, let's go crazy and go. It was, it's sort of like, you know, rush when the, when the label said, you guys better have a hit on the next record. And they went and did, you know, 2112. <laughs> let's go bold. Let's, let's go, let's go big on our, on our own terms. And, uh, so, um, Great pedals, but I guess uh, let me grab a couple of these super chats here because I feel like that would be the right thing to do. Uh, Todd Roy says that he loves your guitar sound. What is the guitar uh, you go to the most? Uh, the Gretsch or the Pal? Pa is it Paoletti or Paoletti? Paoletti, yeah. Paoletti. Um, I mean, they're very different things. I mean, the the Paoletti is like a telly. And right. it's a great sounding telly. And, uh, but, but most of the night I'm on my Gretsch. Okay. It's just, you know, the Gretsch sits so well with Slash's tone. You know, it just, it complements what he's doing. That's sort of my gig, right? Um, yeah. So, and the new signature guitar that I've been using, I'm so excited about because it's really, it's got that that character of the falcon where it sort of sits around slash's tone but it's also uh an incredibly easy guitar to play and you know there's a i'm doing uh there's a 25 was it 24.6 scale um okay. more of a gibson scale and then there's the traditional Gretsch scale as well. So there's two different models. And one the longer scale has the Bigsby and um, the other one is a stop tail. And the with those scale. two, yeah. And with okay. those two covers everything I need. And it seems like you like have an affinity for so many different tones. I was gonna ask you about that. Cause it's like, mm. it's you like tweet amps, but you like Jose Marshalls too, you know? And you, you yeah. like Gretsch thing, yeah. or this, which is, I like a broad palette. I like a uh, <laughs> yeah. I I love to. I like lots of different colors. I mean, there's a lot of different amps I love. There's a lot of guitar. I mean, you know, they make you play differently. They bring out different yeah. things, you know. And you hear yeah. when you're doing a session or something, you hear something and you're like, in your head, okay, I know what I want to use. I want to use an AC30, and I want to use, mm. you know, a Rickenbacker, or I want to, you know, you 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 know what sound you want to you want to go for and yeah I mean, nice and maybe that comes that. with with age and experience and t and getting a, a wide you know that wide palette or whatever that broad mm -hmm. you know the experience and going oh and you draw from that and go like yeah this is a telly through a you know tweed a, deluxe and this is a right. stretch through whatever and yeah. then and then knowing the differences between the different characters between a deluxe and a and a basement and a and a twin you know a, a you know, even even all tweeds, you know, a tweed twin is a totally different animal to a tweed basement, and they're both awesome, and they both have their place. And you know, you could educate us probably for like a half an hour on that, just like talk about the differences between the tweed colors and stuff, and what you would use. Yeah, them yeah. I mean, that's something I I just I'm really passionate about. I mean, boxes too. I mean, you look at the differences between an AC15 and an AC30. You know, is mm -hmm. pretty huge. That's one amp. It's interesting. I was talking with John Serb the other day about the EF86 channel in, in mm -hmm. the original AC15. I just kind of never bonded with the pentode. Like, and it, to me, an AC30 is always, okay, it's either Brian May, normal channel, range master, or it's top boost, and I'm doing hmm. the edge, edge thing or something or that. But the, right, the, right. Do, you, do you dig that, the EF86, like the kind of small? I love it. AC I love it. That yeah. spongier type of, you know, it's... It's gamier. It's um, 
it's more narrow. It's not as broad and open as an AC30. Right. Um, but man, it does. It, it's pretty magical. Did you ever have a um, divided by thirteen? Yeah, I have actually. At this, there's one here that you, is just off the screen. Thirty-seven. I have that. Uh, I have one of those actually, but this is a thirty-one. So this is his AC30 sitting here, uh, which has okay. the pin code tube in the front end. It does. Both okay. Have, yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, and, and, and the FDR and the old matchless had that as well, where they had both. Right. right? Yes. Um, which is yeah. an excellent. They did a really good job. I mean, those original matchless, the very early ones, were fantastic amps. Totally. Uh, I'm the actually, DC30. Yeah. 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 I have yeah. one of those. I'm actually, I, I'm about to sell off a bunch of stuff. Um, okay. A, and I'm, this, so this has been a difficult time for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, because um, I want to buy a very expensive guitar. Ah. So I'm selling off a I'm going through all my guitars and I'm, you know, so out of six or seven juniors, I'm finding my best junior that I'm going to mm. keep. And then I'm going to get rid of everything else. I'm going to find my, you know, I've got my favorite, you know, I've got like a 60 dot neck over here that I use all the time. I'm keeping that, keeping my 53 Esquire. I'm keeping, you know, there's like, I'm going through and man, I, I sat with 10 tellies the other day. <laughs> <laughs> To try and find, you know, we, I've narrowed it down to three. So there you go. But, but yeah, so I'm going to get rid of a bunch of stuff to be able to buy this other really ridiculously expensive guitar. What, what is it? Can you tell us? It's a burst. <laughs> um, That'll be great. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sort of, so I'm, I'm narrowing my palette. <laughs> That's okay. I think it's actually a good thing. I mean, I, I would too. rather have. I would rather have like 10 exceptional guitars than have a hundred that where it's like, oh, I've got, you know, eight here. I never play. And these five yeah. of this version, I don't, yeah. not that I, you know, I'm... you know, I've got, I use, okay. So I use my jazz master all the time. I love jazz masters and they do something really? so unique, you know, but, yeah. you know, I don't not soloing on it, you know, but you know, most of the sessions I'm doing, I'm not soloing anyway. So you know, it's but it it does that indie rock thing that that nothing else does, and I love that tone. But so I'm one jazz master. Um, what else? It, I'm, I'm keeping a sixty one twenty. Okay. Um, a fifty eight. Uh, oh. I think I'm gonna keep a sixty six Strat that I just love. It just sounds great. Sixty six. Great. Yeah. Sunburst 66. It's actually black and it has, oh, and it has black block inlays and binding oh. on the neck. Oh, wow. <laughs> and gold hardware. Yeah. Oh, that is a rare bird. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Not why I'm, I'm keeping it because it sounds great. Oh, cool. That's really unique guitar. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. My first old guitar, like first, oh no, that's not true. I had my 335 first, but my first vintage Fender was a 66 that had been refinned. And I only kept it for a few months. And then I was in Nashville and I went in Gruden's and they had this 64. And I was like, oh, and that was kind of what, what I really wanted. I wanted a pre-CBS. And this was November 64, pre-CBS. <laughs> I've got, got pre-CBS you know. strats and that's the one I <laughs> The 66, yeah. I mean, yeah. I liked my 66, but this this one just spoke to me. So I ended up trading it and uh, you know, I only got the one. But yes, um, yeah, it's good. Old guitars. I love old guitars. That's an interesting period in Fender, 1965, 66, and they were trying different things. And, you know, like your guitar, a unique. Somebody, like, what? what's yeah. the story behind that, I wonder? Like, how did it end yeah, up right? the box? And, yeah, kind of fast. I mean, I always, I, I know Blackmore had one, right? He had a block in, like, the binding. Okay. That I always yeah. thought was cool. That's super cool. I mean, it's really... Yeah. I, what about those... Um, Remember, you know, the 12 string, of course, which I, my favorite 12 string is those Fender, like 65, 66, 12 strings mm -hmm. with the split pickup and all that. But do you remember when they made like in around 68 or 69, they were like, I think trying to use up old bodies and parts and they made a six string version of it with the split no. pickup? No, really? Yeah, yeah, it's oh, super weird. This. The long headstock huh. and everything, but only six tuners and split pickups. And it's a six string version of that, which is just like the weirdest Fender, you know, I love mm -hmm. those. Like kind of so that's your favorite 12, huh? 
I I love those guitars because for me they're playable. For me, okay, the the eighties there was an eighties Tom Petty Rick that came out that was a twelve string, and those I remember being great because the neck's really wide and it's very playable. Because a lot mm-hmm. Ricks I have problems kind of fitting my for whatever reason the neck can be a little small for me. So I love the yeah. Fenders. I've played a few of them that uh, when I used to work for Linda Perry a lot, she had this great 66 Sunburst Fender 12 that was just so playable. And I was like, this is the shit because I can play on it and right, you know, not right. struggle. I, so. You know, I have a, uh, I have a Jerry Jones 12 that I love. It just sounds mm-hmm. so great. I, I mean, I've got Ricks. I've got a few other 12s, but that's the one that I always come back to. Jerry Jones, yeah, those are great. I mean, so it's like a Dano sort of style. Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. Not with cool. the two lipstick tubes. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I'm actually a big Dan Electra fan. Like, I, I like the company mm-hmm. now, and I've got I've got their baritone, which I love. With a, with I a, I have a Jerry Jones baritone, yeah, that oh, I, cool. I love baritones. I was just talking to Keith Nelson about this yesterday, and uh, we were talking about he's doing a record now with uh, this band, and they're using baritones. And I was like, man, you get, he's using Paul Reed Smith. I was like, man, you, baritones for me, I've had baritone Les Pauls. I've had baritone Tom Anderson. It, it Single coils work best, in, in my yeah. opinion. They have mm. that extended scale, like in the fatter strings, it's just even for heavy stuff, it just seems like the the there's so much more definition. And with yeah. a humbucker, it just gets lost, even with a low output humbucker. That's interesting. Yeah, the 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 one I have has the two lip lipstick tube in the in the bridge, and then you can split. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, and cool. So it's a nice option because you can do both, you know. But it has. I find that the actually the humbucking sound works okay for some works pretty good, but it's nice to. I've just got all those options with the split position. It's got kind of like it looks like a P ninety in the neck, or maybe a Jazzmaster style pickup, like a great big single coil. Okay, um, but they're fun. Yeah, interesting. Um, hired Goonage is here in the super chat. I'm just going to grab a couple of these because mm-hmm. folks are coming in fast with the questions. Uh, he says, uh, were you in GNR when Buckethead was there? I believe you were, right? I was. Yeah. I, I read also that you were the, uh, you you besides Axel and Dizzy are actually the longest tenured member in GNR. Yeah, I mean, you've been true. around, You've it's 20 years now, right? Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Long enough to know better, huh? No way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the closest thing to job security I've ever heard in the music business. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. I've had a really fortunate run. I mean, I'm really lucky to uh, be playing with that band, man. I mean, it's been a great gig for me. And I just, I love yeah. everybody that's in the band. That's great. It's like, it's a such a family type of vibe. You know, it's really a great. It's nice it to be in a situation way. like that. It seemed like it was such a volatile band for a long time. And then uh, ever since moving, when, I mean, when Slash came back and, mm-hmm. and Duff and everything, and moving forward, it just seemed like a super well-oiled machine that was like on a, like functioning on a really high level. And went, well, you can't do I, I was just thinking to myself, like, you can't do that without it being a good vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seemed like true. it was just really cool. So Yeah, okay. it's been awesome. I mean, it's, and it's better now than it's ever been that since I've been in it. I mean, uh, yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, well, I just gel really well with, with slash and, you know, Buckethead was a phenomenal, I mean, obviously he's a phenomenal talent, but he's, he's also very musical, you know? So, and it's, as you know, it's really tough to make three guitars work and he got it. Like he, you know, he made it work really well. I was going to ask you about that. Like, the, the what was the uh because obviously there was a reasoning behind there was three guitarists for a long time in the band and was that just different parts that were on the chinese democracy album maybe where they were uh, you know i think curving? um i think honestly axel just had that vision where he wanted three guitars and um it, that was sort of was his that with that album and then live you know that was sort of his vision, his vision. Yeah, so it's tough to make it work. And you did it with with. I mean, there was a, f- a few different folks that came through the band, and and was your role? Uh, w- okay, so he had this vision for three guitar players. Did he have kind of a vision as well? Like, okay, I, w- I would like you to sort of fill this role, and I would like you to fulfill this role, like with the different players, or did a little bit. Yeah, a little yep. bit. Um, you know, but then 
we'd be doing something and then he'd be like, you know what, can, can you play that solo or can you, you know, mm. and then he would listen to it. You know, he's, yeah, he's very tuned in. He, he listens more than any other singer that I've ever worked with. Wow. You know, like when, cause there's a lot of open-ended sections where we're just playing, you know, and it's different every night and he really listens to phrasing and who's doing what. And waits for them to complete their what they have to say, you know what I mean? I see. Which is that's awesome. cool. I mean, very rare in a singer, I think. Yeah. Well, he seems like he's really, you know. I mean, I was really impressed when he went and did ACDC as well. Because that's a tough I mean, you know, I think all of God, us were he, prepared. He like, killed that. I I, I really flew did. to Detroit to see it and I was blown away. You know, and I'm watching it going, Am I just am I loving this because that's my friend <laughs> or right. is it, you know, I'm like looking around at people and everyone was like super into it. I, I just, I think he killed it. I mean, he's so bummed out. I mean, he's just, that's, yeah. you know, he's got that. He can do that. Yeah. I mean, they were able to play songs that they hadn't in a long time. Now, I love Brian, you know, and I, I love, I did, I was, I wasn't prepared to like it as much as I did. I was like, well, this is pretty enjoyable. <laughs> like this is, he's killing. And I, I was just like, that guy wins 2016. I mean, whatever year that was, I think, I mean, coming back with GNR and then going, you know, two stadium tours with you right, know different right. bands. It's just like, that's yeah. unbelievable. So that's, yeah. it, it was really cool to see him uh, just kind of on top of the rock and roll world. Uh, and able able to and now it's great they're they're working with brian and you know it's cool it seemed like it was yeah, a good you know a absolutely i mean done. brian's a legend i mean but yeah. i'll tell you what it was really uh at, he was so he we did a couple of shows i think and then he went off and did that tour and then came back and when he came back man he was singing stronger than i'd yeah. ever heard him i mean he was in he just i'm um, to sing over those i mean you have you ever stood on their stage I know it's insanely loud, oh, right? God. It's it's <laughs> knee bucklingly loud, yeah. and and I like guitar, but Jesus, man! I mean, all those cabs are live. There's no wow dummies yeah. there. It's and they're all on ten. Wow! For those about to rock, yeah. we salute you. Yes. <laughs> so he had to sing over that, and he was telling me he's like, "Man, I figured it out. I figured why Brian sings like this, you know." with his you know because he's he's shielding he's using his body to block the <laughs> the amps right the you know so. <laughs> that's so cool rico so usa sense. says uh he says growing up in st louis which were your favorite concerts you went to that's a great question at the checker dome arena or yeah, I went to, House. I, okay so when i was a kid i don't know if it was this way for you Pete, but when i was a kid like you went to every concert like you went to oh. every big arena show that came through town. I did. Whether you like the band or not, right? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. I, I, I saw mean. sticks. Like, why? Why did I go see sticks? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> and and they're great. I mean, uh, but you went and saw like I mean, God, I went and saw P Funk when I was probably. I went with my drum teacher's kids. Mm. And it was the week after I saw Kiss, I think. That's at, great. You know, at the same venue, at, you know, both Casablanca artists. But um, <laughs> man, I mean, that it was like life altering. I saw so many great concerts there. It was um, a different time, and I don't even think we we maybe even knew like like the you know concerts evolved through the seventies into the eighties, and it became this just it was a new thing and we, i i mean it was just oh well this is normal this is what we do but it was like that didn't exist shows like that in the late 60s and then into the 70s i mean the level of lights and sound and everything and it was just like that i don't know pre-internet and the excitement in the building before the show even in the parking lot mm -hmm. when you walk in i mean that yeah, whole ritual yeah. i it was magic i mean it, and then when yeah. the lights went down and ah, it was like holy shit you know yeah um, yeah so, it was yeah. it was it was magical i mean the I remember the smell of concerts, you know, <laughs> the the sound of the opening band when you're walking into the venue, you know, in these massive venues. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, but isn't it a trip growing up that way? And then now walking out to, it's, you know, the same venues, you know? 
Man, I mean, that must feel like you've gone and played back in your hometown at some of these places and stuff and to walk on that stage. No, because they're not there anymore. So when oh. when we finally, okay, in uh, in the 90s, there was a big riot here in St. Louis at a mm. Guns N' Roses concert, oh, yeah. which I had nothing to do with because I wasn't in the band. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't go to the show because I was actually gigging that night downtown. Mm. And, and a lot of people came from that show to see us after with like pieces of the venue <laughs> like little like with chairs and stuff wow yeah <laughs> and then yeah, you find yourself in this band all these years later it's amazing and, and so we didn't play in st louis until um until what 16 17 maybe okay it was like yeah That's so amazing. that was the first time i'd played st louis with uh with with guns and did it, did, and it was awesome did axel address it at all on stage like oh hey sorry he, about the last time. he handled it <laughs> he handled it perfectly because i yeah. mean there there was such a backlash against the band in town at that time you know like the big mm. rock station we're you know we're never going to play guns and roses again and we're you know it was it was this huge backlash like yeah anyways so he yeah. he did address it and he's like you know he walked on and and he's got like the best sense of humor of you know he's he's awesome and he goes he goes uh yeah it's been a while huh <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, he he sort of he acknowledged it without you know yeah that's great heavy about it Right, had to go there for a second, and then let's but, move on. <laughs> but this was really cool. I bought everybody um, T-shirts from venues that were gone in St. Louis. Oh. Okay, so I bought, like, I got Duff a um, Streetside Records T-shirt um, that he wow, wore wow. on stage. I got Axel this Coral Quartz, which was this infamous um, motel that was ah. in St. Louis. Um, and I wore, like, a, a bar this bar called Kennedy's that I used to play at all the time um, wow. when I was growing up. So my first band played there like all the time. It was sort of our clubhouse. So I wore, I got everyone these shirts and we all wore them that night. So that was, that was pretty cool. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, You must feel like living there now, there must be like you're, you're, you're a hometown hero and some civic pride kind of thing. Like what, you know what I mean? Like that's, do you have that like when you go to any of these places yeah, or see you know i guess you know i don't go out a whole lot when i'm home hmm. i'm the you know, well, sort of the last now, thing I, well yeah. yeah obviously but but um you know even when i'm touring i don't go out and see much music you know i'll go out and see friends when they're in town you hmm. know um but i'm just not here enough. you know I don't, when i'm here i want to be dad not right sure I yeah. never go out. Uh, let's see here. Here's a, a question from More Guitars. Uh, if adding new gear to your Guns N' Roses rig, does it need vetting and approval from anyone? Or do you, that's a good question, or do you just have it arrive? Um, do you get kind of free reign to, as far as guitars go and that kind of thing? Like what you, you use? You mean, does anybody, does, does Slash go, hey, uh, I, don't, I don't like that one? <laughs> no, I've never had that happen. That's good. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. I mean, gigs I've, I've done where singers are like, yeah, I don't know about that guitar. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I've never never had anybody like go get rid of that. But uh, but I've had a few where it was like, maybe you should play that other one, you know? <laughs> yeah. I know Axel wasn't very crazy about um, Ron's, uh, uh, he had a foot guitar. It was shaped like a foot with B stripes on it, like, and okay. when he would use the whammy bar, wings would come out. <laughs> He's so, so unique. Wasn't, wasn't big on that. Yeah. So getting a little far away from the Guns N' Roses vibe. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's interesting, you know, because I found that 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 period of the band interesting because he did have Buckethead and Ron and these kind of like real characters, like interesting musicians that had a lot of individual personality that weren't you know, the typical rock guitar player. Yeah, I mean, Robin Fink <laughs> is definitely a personality, you know, and a phenomenal Yeah, Robin player. as well. And you. I mean, all you guys had your unique, you know. Yeah. You know, Robin has a, man, 
I really enjoyed playing with him. Great. Yeah. Great feel. Like, again, understood how to make the three guitar thing work. And really, um, yeah, he was a lot of fun to play with. He's an amazing guitar player, I think. And he is part of the sound. I mean, with, you know, next to Trent. I mean, it's like he is the guitar player of that band, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with nails. And it's like, it's a good. Yeah, though he doesn't record with, I mean, you know, on the albums, it's all Trent. What about back in the day, though? Yeah, it's all Trent. Really? Mm -hmm. oh, see, you just blew one of my rock and roll. <laughs> I thought, I thought maybe that was him, like on the, uh, you know, back downward spiral. Days downward spiral? No. Uh, that, okay. From my understanding, um, it was that was all Trent. That he plays all parts. That's interesting. Okay. Well, now we but know. Robin is, Robin's a really great player. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I'm the glad that, uh, you know, in Guns, he was able to show that. Yeah, I remember he completely, and he switched up his image. I remember he had super long hair and a beard and everything going yeah, for a while. while. I remember, I'll never forget him showing up. Because for a while, he had like the top of his head shaved, and it was like long in the back, and <laughs> we called it a skullet. But uh, <laughs> but then he showed up, at, and you know, he used to, he had like long little pieces here, and it, it, it was crazy you know, makeup and stuff. And then he showed up at my apartment one time in New York and he had like long, he looked like Jesus. He had the beard and he had the long hair. Yeah. 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 Like I'm just going to do this full on like seventies thing for a minute. Yep. <laughs> it's cool. Um, let's see here. Arthur's asking an interesting question. He's in the super chat and he says, what's your go-to distortion amp or pedal? And, uh, I was going to segue that into asking you about your, maybe your, your Jose Marshall. And cause I bet you're kind of an amp distortion guy that also appreciates some pedals, right? Fuzz. Yeah. I love us. Um, but I'm not a distortion guy. I mm. like overdrives, you know, like anybody else. I like a good clone. Um, I love the, uh, solo Dallas. Oh yeah. Have you, are you hip? You have one of those? I know that dude. Yeah. Well, I've got his. Uh, okay, I've got one of these sitting right here, and I lent. Yeah, that's what I use. I, lent, I have one sitting right here. Of uh, the pedal one. No, or one of those. One. The original okay, cool. power one. Do you and think they sound uh, different in the pedal? Or? Yes. I mean, okay, so he, Phil brought out three. He brought out the pedal. He brought out mm -hmm. the new tower, and then the original tower that they'd come out with originally. And uh, we listened to all three in a blind test, and I picked the original tower every time. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. It's got a special thing for sure, like that boost compression thing that it does. Yeah. It's 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 weird what it does, isn't it? It's it's very um it's very subtle. Uh, but it does something really cool to your tone. I mean, it shifts the mid-range and it gives everything more teeth. Before a Marshall, it's like you know, if you before a plexi, it just makes it roar. You know, it's without yeah. without um, boosting it in a an artificial way. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it definitely. It still it's gotta... sounds like a Marshall. It just sounds like a yeah. really aggressive Marshall. And I use those live. I mean, I've got oh. um, I've got two of them built into a rack that they made oh, okay. for me, and uh, because it's such an important part of my rig, and that's. It, it's i'm all about the volume knob you know you're a single cham channel amp kind of yeah, guy right yeah and volume knob for clean kind of thing yep yeah old school do, do you use more and than one to, amp live or? i use two amps but they're i'm hitting the front end of both of them all night so i've got like a supro combo and then i've got my big um 100 watt amp that i hit cool. both of those all night and then it's just all in the volume. And then I'll kick on, like I'll kick on the solo Dallas for my heavier sounds. There's times when I'll use a, a Colt, like a Joe Gore Colt. Oh yeah. Are you hip Joe. to those? Yeah. I know some of his pedals. I think I've tried that, that one years ago and he's got the really unique fuzzes and stuff too. Yeah. 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 He makes some great stuff, but that's another one that I use live. And then also a love pedal eternity I've used for years. Good pedal. I just, Man, it's it's very unique, and it's just sort of become sort of part of my voice. I think you know. I like that pedal years. a lot. 
That used to be my, th you're making me want to, it's here somewhere and I should go find it and try it later today. Cause that was always a great, you know, it, you know, that it's all about that. Uh, there's a treble booster built in on that second knob that you can just bring up a little bit and it's got that infinite sustain, but it's also very, there's so much definition. So you can actually play chords and, you know, hear every note. And Is that what's uh, an eternity, a treble boost on the? I didn't know yeah. that. But, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense because that's my memory of it. It was it's a long time ago that I used to use it, but I used it as my main sort of lead boost for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. it did have a real clarity to it. It was great. It, bef actually, that I was using a clon before that and um, on my board, and then I got rid of the clon and was using the Eternity. Wow. Now, okay, I'm going to have to check this out because I've been, I've been uh, an archer guy for a long time, which is great. The, yeah. Man, I, I love the archer. I mean, the archer is a clone. There's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, have you tried his Jeff Beck version? No, I was going to ask you about that, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, this thing sits here all the time. I mean, I'm, yeah, I love them. They're great. Really good. Yeah, he made I me have, this one that he said's got the, the different parts in it or something, and that was the, the Jeff, Jeff Beck, Beck one. Version. Yeah, and that's what I've been using for years. I just I put it on my board, and it's like this is great. And I just happy with it so okay yeah i, I don't know how to print it sounds okay i remember doing this uh, uh shootout a little while ago with dave friedman like probably four years ago now or something but we had an original clone because he was putting it on a board for somebody and i said let's listen to that compared to like a couple other clones i have here and one mm -hmm. of them was the archer and one of them was a rocky repaired amp uh clone and I wanted to just go, oh, they're all going to be the same, you know? And it was like the original, just, we were like, mm, sounds a little, sounds a little better. Like there's something about it. It's a little better. And we're like, shit. I was like, I don't want to like it more. Cause they're like, hmm. at that point they were $2,500 and now they're like five grand. Um, yeah. Plus, but it just sounded a little better. So then I got there's the, another one I have. Oh, this one is also great. Oh, what's, what's that one? It's the, cool. uh, uh, what's the name of this company? Mythos. Oh, okay. Mythos. Yeah. Out of Nashville. And it's, it's a really good one. That's cool. I should try that as well. Just because I don't, I we don't have the, enough clones to try. <laughs> yeah. Right. I do the, um, you know, where I compare the Archer with the original one and man, I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, reassuring then because i should with this jeff beck one i felt like it maybe sounded a little better and i and i never got to ab it directly with that other you know the original clone but i thought well maybe it's there since you know and so it's I've, I've just had it on my board forever um and i gotta get one of those now the jeff beck one it's cool he's a great guy chris van tassel he's super super I, cool yeah guy. i don't know him i just buy oh, his stuff off reverb i'll put you guys together <laughs> after the show that's I'll, I'll put you in touch with them. Rich Monks is up there in the top chat. Oh, I want to come back here. I want to talk to you about Jose Marshall's, but uh, okay. Rich says, uh, I have no fear of public speaking, but when playing for a crowd, my picking hand gets shakier than Gene Wilder's <laughs> shooting hand in blazing saddles. <laughs> <laughs> Considering amputation and installing robot arm, please help. Um, What do you think about that? Like about nerves? Uh, man, or... I don't know. I mean, I've been playing... I've been playing in front of crowds for so long. I mean, my whole life. I don't. I don't hmm. remember. I mean, it, it, I started on violin when I was what four or five. I mean, I you know you, part of the Suzuki method was you know you do recitals every you know couple months. Wow. So that I answers mean, a, a question I had for you. Actually, I was going to say how did violin and cello sort of inform and affect your guitar playing, but that's maybe even more profound. That early well, Suzuki, I mean, the whole Suzuki method is based on mimicking, you know, so it developed my ear. It also made me a really shitty um, sight reader. So uh, me yeah. too. I can't read for shit. But. Oh, dude. OK, so I'm doing I'm doing this. I'm working on this cue right now for a video game and I, it's mm. a classical guitar piece, which. I studied classical guitar in school, so I've so I'm like going through the sheet music, figuring out the voicings, and like you know, because he's a piano. The composer is a good friend of mine, um, BT, and the way he he's a piano player, so 
you know, I'm trying to figure out, okay, if I'm, you know, a classical guitar, you've got to figure out how you can hit everything. You know, it's very broke sounding and Mm. yeah. So that's been my morning. (laughs) But that's amazing. And I I suck at sight reading. I suck so bad. And, And I haven't done any, uh, you know, classical note reading like that in so long that. Do you feel like it's just guitar is a hard instrument to read on though, compared to violin or cello? It, like yeah, that? absolutely. I mean, I look. I've, but you know what? Since I was a kid, I would look at pianists and how they, because they're always the best sight readers. But how the hell do you sight read right and left handed at the same time? I, I can't. I could never get my head around that. Mm, right. Yeah, me neither. I was really bad at it, and just all by ear. Yeah, reading um, chord charts is one thing, but you know, right? I, sure. Because yeah, that's open that. to then it's like, oh, it's this chord. I can play it like this, play it like this, play it like this. But when I see, for some right. reason single notes and chord stacks when I'm reading them, I, I can't translate that into uh, like I, I always see the guitar uh, as far as reading goes as have, as being like a whole bunch of keyboards stacked on top of one another, kind of going like this. Right, you've right. Got all these strings like, well, where yeah. do I play that note? I can play it here, play it here, and by mm-hmm. then, the, you know, it's just confusing. But um, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, no, I always found it to be that. So way, I don't sure. know what to say to rich monks. Um, man. You know, Rich, always go for the simpler thing. Like I would say, like, remember that you're playing live and these intricate things that sometimes we work on and these days with guitar playing and everybody doing their perfect performance on Instagram and all that and everything. In a venue, it's like we, we have to remember sometimes that I feel like people out there can't even really maybe, I mean, even experienced listeners can't even sometimes discern if your guitar is totally in tune or not. Like if the yeah. song's rocking and the energy's there in the room and there's it's reverberating around and stuff going for this, you know, it never hurts to just hit a note and bend and put your arm up in the sky, and get some feedback and like the simpler thing. And knowing that I always think that the crowd is, they're not against you. Like they're there with you, you know, they're there to, they're, they've got your back. Like they're there to have a good, well, unless it's, you know, certain bands, I guess, or certain punk shows or something where maybe it's more violent or, but towards the, but generally speaking, the folks are there, they, they want to have a good time and they want to, you know, it's a celebration. And it's like, so, so you're starting off in a good place before you even hit a note, like the folks have your back. And they, man, I think, I think the only way to really get better at that is just to do it like anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you've just got to get out and play. I mean, did you grow up? You grew up playing clubs, right? Yeah. I mean, from the time I was 14, I was sneaking into bars uh, because the drinking age in Alberta was is still 18. So and I look kind of, you know, I grew up to pretty much like 5'11 by the time I was in seventh grade. And. I, I could get into clubs. But so. You didn't have underage. See, I, I grew up going to underage clubs and playing in underage clubs. You know, the punk oh, clubs okay. were all underage. So, so I was able to play every weekend when I was 14. I mean, I was point we were gigging all the time. Wow. I didn't really do that. I more like snuck in to play with Mike. I had this teacher that let me sit in with his band. So he'd get me up on stage to play and I'd be like the, all these older musicians. And I was like 15. Right. And I, I would go do that or, yeah, a couple different bands that I knew where it was like older musicians that were mentors of mine and friends that had bands. And I'd go down and sit in and they'd let me play. Other than that, it was me playing like the high school dance or, right. um, you know, things like that, whatever. But I always had a band and I was always practicing and playing. But I probably didn't gig as much as you before. When And then when I was 19, it was L.A. and went to M.I. and then started. Oh, gigging. OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Started see, I was playing. I was playing, you know all the time we were traveling my first band wow. um would travel to all the being in st louis we'd go to all the college towns you know around the midwest from chicago to kansas city to you know indiana to you know there, we'd always be hitting all the college towns so you know carbondale illinois or champaign or uh yeah. um you know west you know from kansas city you go to lawrence and then columbia and you know there was all these the colleges and that's the type of music we're playing so i see that's awesome in that experience yeah it's just like it seems uh it, well and playing violin from age of four suzuki and doing recitals it just gets like you probably feel more comfortable in front of a crowd than not <laughs> right that's, yeah uh, yeah get, probably get yeah that's yeah, amazing there is something you're you, 
you're right. I mean, because there, there is like that, that Zen thing of walking on stage and uh, because you've got to be in the moment, you know, you never, I, I don't know. That thing is a, uh, well, it's like, it's a bit of a drug almost. I find it feels like, but I loved, I never felt it more than playing with Chris Cornell, but when, because that was probably just stylistically and stuff for me, the most in tune with my rock guitar right aspirations or whatever but when right. we would walk on stage and we were like a team you know and like mm -hmm. a, like you know we that that band i can remember that feeling of you know lights going down walk out and everybody's and you're just like let's, let's do this you know i'm ready like and it was it's a great feeling when you're there's a synergy with the band and everything i went through a period of actually uh being more nervous on stage and not that long ago i mean like 10 years ago maybe or where I started to develop this, like where I had, and maybe it was the gigs I was doing because I, I just felt more pressure uh, than I'd ever felt. And it was weird. And it was like, I kind of had to work through it um, and figure out ways to feel more comfortable because I'd never right. had that. And then all of a sudden there it was, and it was like, so it was a weird thing to have a nerves later on huh. and have to work through it. Um, but I, then I just kind of like the things I was saying to Rich, like, uh, I, you know what I did was I I I started to have go to things that I would think about on stage to refocus me and be in the right moment. What was and the gig? Of, what's that? What was the gig? Uh, I guess at the time it was maybe honestly when I was playing with Don with Henley. Um, okay. And there's a lot there was a you know there's a lot of pressure to play right, you know like right. playing Hotel California with Don Henley like you can't. It's got to be, yeah. I don't know, I felt the weight of the music or something. Right, right, I, right. You know, and not that I ever had any problems. Like, I didn't, but I would feel like this. Well, if you did have a problem, <laughs> there was always a couple times where he would give you the stink eye like nobody else, you know. And right. you deserved it, you know. <laughs> so but I, I can remember one time starting a song wrong or something, and he would look at you like, Ooh. <sighs> Like I, I, uh, I reversed the. I just heard the drum count wrong. Of uh, we used to do this verbatim cover of "Everybody Wants to Rule the World," and I heard you know instead of hearing one, two, three, four, I heard two, three, four, and thought it was one, two, three. Oh. So I came in a, a yeah, came in a quarter note off or whatever. And I've uh, all done that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's okay. But um, anyways, but during that gig, I I had to figure out my uh way to recalibrate my head a little bit. And what worked right. for me was I, I had become a big Jack White fan because It Might Get Loud came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I liked his attitude in that movie more than anything. And his, his like, I don't give a shit, like just kind of like, I'm gonna go, like there is no mistakes, like whatever. And uh, so I would think about him and the way he, his attitude, and that helped. It helped me right. recalibrate my brain when I was in a moment of feeling like, it was like just, you know, and then I would, be, and then I'd be back and not nervous anymore. Okay. So maybe those little things, like if you can think of a player that you like, what would this guy do or whatever in that moment? I almost like that's what I was saying to Rich to go primitive, play like less, like don't worry about your picking hand shaking, like so, right. so just play a chord and let it ring, and then don't you know, and and rem and look at somebody in the crowd and connect with them or something, and they're having a good time and smiling, and then and then your hand's not shaking anymore. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I do that a lot. I focus on somebody in the crowd. Yeah. 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 Because there's, but, but it's that thing where you're, you can't think about, I mean, that's, that's what I love about playing with Slash is that he's all about rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing so that you right. don't, you know, you don't, when you walk out on stage, you never have to think because you are a conduit, you know, it's all just flowing through you and it's, you yeah. don't have to, you know, and that's that's the way rock and roll should be. I think I did you a never gig with be him. thinking about it, right? I I did a gig with him, and that was my takeaway. I was, was surprised. Yeah, yeah, I was really surprised at how much he he was really like. I remember being at sound check, so I went to his house, and we we went over songs a few times that we were doing. It was for a uh, a, a uh, music cares benefit okay thing. yeah and yep. um and so with beth hart singing and we did one of her tunes i think a couple tunes that he'd done with her or something and then we did a whole lot of love i remember and matt Soren played drums i remember but anyways um i remember going to his house and working on it and then doing sound check and playing through the songs 
playing through the song twice and I remember we kind of nailed it the first time like one of these tunes we nailed it the first time second time there was a little error somewhere and somebody said oh we'll be fine you know that's okay that won't happen on the gig and slash was like i don't think we should get too confident let's play it one more time yeah. and i was like ah that's really cool like he really had that yeah man i'll tell you what we rehearse a lot yeah you know? and, and it's not like you know we'll get there we'll hang out we'll hang out afterwards but when mm. we're once we start he does not take his guitar off for you know six hours you know it's like and and doesn't sit wow. down yeah it's like we've got you know but i mean you know you know how he is he just he loves to play he just loves to play yeah i mean i was really impressed by that and seeing this is because it, maybe that's like well that's good rich too like did you practice it so much that you can't you know that it feels like second nature you know yeah you don't want to think about stuff when you walk on stage because because he's maybe that he seems really free when he's soloing and stuff and just going for it and that comes through doing over and over and over i guess he is totally free i mean he yeah. walks out on and this is why he is the legend that he is is he will walk out on stage and play a solo by himself by himself in front of the stadium and every night it's different he doesn't know what he's going to do i mean not not like subtle variations he's it's completely different wow it's you know i can see him every night <laughs> yeah and, and man it's it's mind-blowing you know you listen to like hendrix shows you know from four different nights and he'll play be playing the same set list but it's completely different right what he's playing that's a you know that those are that's why those guys are legends living on the living on the edge like that kind of yeah 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 that that in in province let's see what the night brings and i love that yeah that's a, a thing that for me uh well it's a, it's a good lesson for me to to you know i'm still learning things all the time and playing with somebody like melissa Etheridge, it was a little like that where she wanted it to be different every night like i remember her was a little, improv was a big part i of love it. that I love that. And, you know, Slash and I really challenge each other. Well, he challenges me <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to play, diff you know, to, because he's doing, he's approaching, you know, there's a, there was a moment on the uh, tour on the, not in this lifetime tour where we would do a cover while they're bringing out the piano for a while there, we were doing uh wish you were here where it was just Slash and I, and I play the melody and then uh, you know he played the intro solo, and then we just go back and forth over the changes. Mm. And it was so you know listening to him play every night, and he would approach approach it completely different. So I would have to come, you know, I can't, you know. And as a guitar player, when you're touring, you sort of fall into your things, you sure. know, right? Sure. But he, I, I mean, I don't know if I do that to him, but I know he does it to me and keeps me from that happening falling into safe ruts you know yeah challenging you keeping yeah it. yeah that's really yeah because cool. he's he's approaching every solo completely differently i mean obviously the ones that everyone's singing he's <laughs> right you know in south america they, they sing the guitar solos with you so oh god that's no place reminds me more of like when we were growing up and concerts were the way they were, that's what South America still like to me. Right. <laughs> like yes. that, it's yes. like the seventies or something or the, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I love playing down there. Best crowds in the world. I always say yeah. that. Um, Absolutely. Let's see here. I'm going to, uh, there's a couple of super chats from a long time ago and I'm going to try and get back to them here. And hey, see if I can... you know what? Oh yeah. Can I, can I run to the bathroom real quick and come oh, back? Of course, dude. Okay. Absolutely. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> it's answer some super chats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is this has been a lot of fun, folks. This is this is awesome, and thank you all for the uh, the questions here. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take pictures on my phone as they disappear, and I try and come back to them. Uh, you know, if I'm missing, so know that I'm doing that. But if I miss one, you know, go ahead and ask again, and I'll see if I can come back to it. I think I've answered. Yeah, we got to all those, and so we'll ask this question from SD Design when he comes back. How are you guys doing out there? Everybody hanging in? 
Uh, Stephen Douglas says, Hanley was even critical of your amps. Didn't he ask you to change to a Fender? He didn't. He was more like joking, like, got any Fender amps? <laughs> I remember him saying that. Um, you know, he's just a fan. And that, that's kind of his sense of humor, which yeah, actually has a really good sense of humor. But that would be something that he would he would say, you know, um, just because I, I had a Marshall in there. And it would have been more appropriate to probably have a Fender amp. I've always said if I played with Don again that I would probably use a Hedgehog, Sir Hedgehog or something. Because it would be a great, you know, that slightly smoother distortion thing. Uh, let's see here. Back. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, for uh, you. Know, if you got to run or anything, let me know. You know. No, man, this is so much fun. Oh, awesome. Okay, so uh, SD Design is just asking which chorus did you use in Love Spit Love? Uh, it's a great question, actually, because I wanted to ask you about that band and then about what your time. What chorus first. did I use? Yeah, would I don't you remember use ever using a chorus? Hmm. Interesting. I'm sort of the anti-chorus guy. Are Vernon you? You're Reed, not a chorus guy. <laughs> no, Vernon <laughs> Reed just made me get an aqueduct. So <laughs> he's like, no, you've got to get one. They're the coolest pedals. This, but um, I've never been much of a chorus guy. Uh, is there a song that you're thinking of? Yeah, I wonder. SD Design, put it down in the uh, in the chat, and we'll come back to it. Did you, What about on any of the uh, – because then you did Psychedelic Furs, of course, after. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. would you have, you wouldn't have used one then either on any of that material? Mm, no. Okay. No. I will, I'll use a phaser. I won't use a – I'm not a – yeah uh, vibrato <laughs> vibra right so a little bit more of the uh the uh well less of that I, I i've come back around to actually digging chorus um okay i yeah, was just I never know. it always sounded cheesy to me i mean i think it goes back to being a kid you know and the bands you know the strap with the cs3 and the chorus i you know a, a jazz core a jc120 or something you know like i i just that was not where i was at i totally get it i do i i but vibrato I, stereo magnetone vibrato that's oh god shit. yeah do you have one of those amps the stereo magnetone I have tons of them really i've got old ones <laughs> old ones yeah oh god even the new one i loved the new one i tried it at, in nashville once and it was like okay this is so the guy that design the guy that designed all of those lives down the street from me and we grew up together no way. Wow. Yes. And the guy that bought Magnetone, our fathers were partners in a company called St. Louis Music. Oh, okay. Which did okay. anything. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Crate and Electra and Alvarez, right? So then he bought Magnetone. Okay. And started that brand up. And my buddy Obed designed all of those uh, reissues. And they're great. They're great. They're just man really they uh, they sure sound good they're just this is the most sort of spacious i don't know you can sit there and write songs for like as soon as i plug in i'm like oh here i just want to write riffs now or, you know yeah stuff, that's like, there and when you have um so i have an m20 which is like one of the rarest probably the rarest magnetone and it okay. had um three different cabinets all the same size and there's 212 <laughs> in one cabinet there's two 12s in the other cabinet and in the middle there's two amps there's the you know an amp on the bottom and an amp on the top okay it's a stereo so you can it, it's and so i can mic up both cabs and you've got this stereo vibrato thing that's just magical it's incredible yeah. almost sounds like vibe right like, like it, a, yes it's like so it's... lush and beautiful yeah that's a great Those sound are, yeah, man, those magnets are are just magical. Uh, Anthony's up in the super chat, and he says that he had the pleasure to work with you in New York. I'm going to come back to uh, Atomic Slam here, who I've got up on the screen. But Anthony says he had the pleasure to work with you in New York at Bear Tracks as an assistant engineer. Honky toast with Andy. We geeked out about furs and New York dolls. Thanks, he says. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Anthony. Uh, those, though, that was, a that was a lot of fun. I mean, but, but honestly, I, I coming clean, that was a dark, uh, period for me, um, mm. drug wise, mm. <laughs> I was a pretty messy time. So mm. I don't have a whole lot of memory from that, uh, period, but yeah, that was, um, that I remember that studio was in upstate New York and we did overdubs there. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. 
and had a great desk. Had a great it was desk. An interesting studio. Yeah, yeah, interesting studio. But working with Ant, I mean, I loved working with Andy. I worked with Andy. I was lucky enough to work with Andy Jones on a bunch of stuff. That's cool. Yeah, he's a legend, right? I mean, when yeah. the sound. I, God. Best engineer I've ever worked with. You know, it's just the, uh, those English engineers, like you know him and Roy Thomas Baker, same way. I, they just they know how to work an EQ and a compressor like nobody else. And yeah, they they grew up with a. Uh, I've got a good friend actually named Steve Holroyd that was Glenn John's second for a long time, and mm -hmm. same thing. I mean, he grew up in the studios in London and stuff, and worked with Glenn on a bunch of projects, and they just know how to. I mean, you record, they record and you walk in after doing a basic or whatever, and you walk in the control room. It just yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And yeah. like with that album, with the, the, um, he was just talking about the Anthony was talking about, uh, had, had we stopped at that point, it would be great. Hmm. You know, cause <laughs> I remember we tracked, we, you know, we did a song, all right, come on in and listen. And we go yeah. in and listen, and it was like, oh my god, this is Led Zeppelin! Like it was the greatest, yeah. like the dr just dry with nothing on it. It was just like everything's perfect. Yeah, push and the if faders we up. Stop there. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, not go crazy with overdubs or whatever. Yeah. Well, and substances, yeah, substances and overdubs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, that's cool though. That's amazing, Andy. Oh God, what a legend! I mean, he was the one guy that with Van Halen that I felt like, wow, he kind of changed the sound of the band and did like he did what no one else. See, the band always was kind of like you know had this sound it's amazing it's van halen but it was sort of bass shy and whatever and had its its thing and then when andy got involved it was like okay this record sounds really different and cool yeah yeah he managed yeah. to achieve a cool you know the, a different sound for them that was really cool maybe because i mean i never met him but i, I sense he was just as kind of a bold personality and, and, and probably very, like, yeah very larger than life yeah yeah, yeah, so they they met their their equal as far as like a sonic, you know. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Uh, Atomic Slam, Slam says, "Reading charts, you can thank God you guys don't play the drums. You have no idea how good you have it." Oh come on, you drummers! <laughs> Dr drums? Oh come on! <laughs> how many notes are on a guitar that you have to deal with? How many? <laughs> this is the thing. I want to I want to do a tour on bass because there's one part. Oh yeah, do... you've got one part you you can play through, plug in direct into the amp. You know, exactly. you get an SVT, and you you're like, there you go. Yeah, P bass tuner SVT. What more do you need? This is great. Yeah, <laughs> one you get, to learn. You get paid by the note, <laughs> and you get paid the same as the guitar player that's got to cover yeah. seven parts. You know, like right. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, on Tone Talk, you were talking about that, like with the Chinese democracy material compared to the older GNR material, you've got to cover a lot of stuff. And like, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Because there was so much on that record, you know, um, texturally. Yeah, yeah. So I've got to carry a lot more. Otherwise, man, I'd just be, you know, a couple of pedals and that's it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it's, I've got to have a pretty uh, big rig because of, those songs and the thing is is we don't do them all the time you know but mm. for when we do you know you got to be ready yeah so do you yeah. because you're kind of a volume knob and two amp all they're running all the time sort of guy like how do you deal with that when it comes to effects to say are you running mostly pedals in front or do you have anything post that you're running I, I am running um my voodoos which are uh copies of my, my jose they're basically but they yeah. you know we've been speaking on them for years and so they become their own thing but um those have effect uh, they have effects loop so i am running post that's some cool. stuff in the loop okay that's interesting yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know delays and reverbs delays and reverbs right mm -hmm. um how do you no, so no that amp uh, was your first exposure to those amps like the Jose kind of mod? Uh, was that the the seventy three that you bought that was used mm -hmm. to belong to Mick? Yes. Yeah. And was that a thing where you and were just like got it home? And I like, went, oh my god. Yeah. Well, I went to his house and I played through a bunch of them, and um, they all had that real uh, compressed eighties. You know, you know they're fun to play on. 
but they don't have that really super aggressive martial thing that I love. You know, they don't have that that Angus thing or that Malcolm thing more appropriately. This one Jose amp that I, it did have that. It was big and open. It mm. wasn't in dynamic. So, you know, as you dug in, it, you know, it hit harder. Yeah. It wasn't like you could breathe on the strings and, you know. Right. You know. So yeah. it wasn't a lot of gain. It wasn't a lot of preamp gain. It's, it's, uh. It's not a very gainy amp. Right. Yeah, I think people have this preconceived notion that they're super gainy or something, but they're not necessarily. It depended on maybe the... You individual. know, a lot of the other ones that I played, uh, that I have played over the years, have been very, you know, gainy, preempt. Quite gainy. Gain. Yeah. yeah. Dave but did... But that one, I mean, the best, the best ones are not, I think. Dave did a mod for me um after you know it was it was an interesting period like where this through his shop came a slew of jose's uh that folks were getting you know, steve vise and um and john sykes and all these amps came in james hetfield like all these like famous players jose's that have been used on a lot of records and stuff and so it was interesting because i got to play through a lot of them and uh and listen to a lot of them and, and at the same time dave had been in like 15 of them already but he also kind of like solidified i think what he liked about the different things that Jose was doing to these amps back in the day then. And then he modded this Germino that I've got here. That's a, I was looking for a good donor amp to kind of do this with. And I found this Germino in Nashville. That's basically a 68, you know, it's his headroom 100 amp. That's a yeah. Old, yeah. Actually, a and and they're amp. great. Those Germinos are great. Oh, I got it. And I plugged it in. I was like, Oh shit. Cause it sounded so good. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this to this amp. Cause it's just really a great, it's sounded just right. so clear and aggressive and cool like not gainy aggressive you, that thing you're, you're talking about it just had it in spades i was like do i want to do this uh, but we did it and actually i feel like i didn't lose anything like i can still get that old thing if i want to and he's kind of refined a few things about the way that right. jose used to do things and now he's he's made it a little make it a little more sense and put that in that amp so i love that but um you know i use um for modding, I, I buy PA heads, Marshall PA heads, like old Plexi PA heads, because yeah. I don't feel so bad about it. <laughs> and and right. plus, it's it's easier. I've got two of them here. I've got a 50 and a 100. And it's gr Obed, my buddy that does Magneton that I was talking about, that yeah. lives up the street, he does all my amp work here in town. And he has... Trick, trick these out you know where he basically the first channel is stock the second channel is like having the bass and treble jumped but mm -hmm. he tightens up the bass so it's actually usable it's not too flubby there's not it's real tight cool and that's my favorite and then the third channel dumps into the fourth because you can pick up that extra preamp tube mm -hmm. you know so then you've got the jose gainy thing you know Gain boost in front of plexi yeah and it's great because in the studio you've got all you've got all three now the one i normally use is the channel two because that's like the you know nope. stock when he did that did he so you've got the internally ganged bass and treble channel did he mm -hmm. do it so that there's no gain loss like you would get with a cable when you jump her right right there's no that's gain the, loss and the and the right. bass is really you know when you jump them a lot of times you the you can only turn the bass up a little bit, right? You know, because it gets too woofy and you lose the definition and stuff. And There's something about this, doing this gets rid of that and it yeah. stays tight and just you know thumpy and kicks you in the chest. Yeah, it's cool. I'd never experienced that before. Dave did the same thing on this one, so that I can gang the two channels and I can do it with the boost in front too, so I can have the Jose thing. Because you've got the, the the whatever the double O two two cap trimming all the bass out of that first gain stage, but then being able to add in the the normal channel or whatever the volume two mm -hmm. channel uh, at, at any level and kind of get that fullness back out of that back is I don't know it's just a great circuit it's really cool yeah they're so fun yeah um let's see here linger one two three four says thanks for doing this really awesome i know i i concur thank you for being here man this is so fun oh thank you for doing this oh it's just a pleasure hey, thanks for thinking of me this is really sweet oh man i mean i like i said i've wanted to chat with you for the longest time you know because when i i you know i got a, a sense from your instagram 
it's like wow like and then i saw youtube maybe it was a, a rig rundown kind of video with you and i was like I, we, i've got to talk to this guy <laughs> he's got such a great you know perspective and you just seem like the nicest cat and stuff so anyways uh, that but i definitely have um, a good perspective <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Oh, there's an interesting question. Michael says, uh, can you talk about the influence a fellow named Duke Michalak had on me? Michalak was a guitar. He's a guitar teacher here in St. Louis and I still take lessons from him, but uh, oh, yeah, wow. he was, he was a, definitely a big influence on me and uh, as well as a lot of other guitar players from St. Louis. But yeah, he's, you know, he's, I guess every town has them, you know, those guys. Right. That, the, like the local kind guru. of yeah yeah and so you still take lessons that's fascinating and mm -hmm. and so when you go there what will you say like i need help with this or uh you know we it just sort of it, it just feels real naturally we just sit and play and he'll be like hey check this out you know i've been working on huh. this, you know and it's, it's sort of what it's like you know that's i think great. i get that same impression from uh like so many guys study with satriani mm. you know from it just seems like he was the same way. Yeah, I mean Steve and Kirk Hammett, and it's like so many yeah, I was, people. Well, I was talking to Charlie Hunter took from him. Oh yeah, wow, wow. Which I was, he he mentioned that the other day, and I was surprised. I didn't realize that. Joe seems like a great like any of the videos I've seen of him breaking things down on the internet. Uh, you know, he he seems very uh, like articulate, and he can he's he's got that rare skill of being able to show you what right. he's doing. Uh, right communicate it you know uh, josh smith is that way as well the way he sure. it, it, the way he breaks stuff down makes sense you know yeah at least to really me. good teacher really good yeah, teacher. it seems like he would be a really great teacher yeah i actually bought like one i think it's a true fire course or something from josh and i have to get more into it but he's great at explaining things uh robert says just an acknowledging to uh it's obed is that the fellow that you were? Obed, with? yeah. Obed. Obed, sorry. Yeah. Uh, lots of respect for this guy who years ago recommended some mods on my amps. Nice to, nice to hear his name here. Cool. He's yeah. also a, a fantastic player. Oh, cool. And like I said, we grew up, you know, our bands grew up together playing. And he got my got me my first 50 watt small box, I think, and tricked it out. And, you know, this, we wow. know each other for a so, long so time. Cool. Yeah, it's great to have somebody like that that you can count on. That's like I'm at um, his house every few days, dropping off and picking up. <laughs> with the amount of gear you've got, yeah, uh, yeah just amps, you know. What about guitars? Do you have somebody local you like for guitars? In St. Louis? There is an amazing luthier here in St. Louis. That's the you know even when I was living in New York, I would always send guitars bigger projects i would always send to him because i've never found anybody better mm. that's cool oh mike linhoff asked that question i remember that guy I, hey mike <laughs> there's a, someone uh, else here uh, james sound, sounds like maybe uh james Camperato, uh, who another one of my favorite guitar players in st louis oh wow so what's cool. going on james this is awesome i mean it's amazing to you know I, I okay. don't know. Sometimes the internet drives me crazy, and it's also amazing. <laughs> Pale, okay, so Pale Divine was my first band. Um, oh, okay. And we used to play. It was a big sort of cult band in St. Louis, you know, or in the Midwest. And uh, yeah, he met his wife at one of our shows. I think a lot of people met their wives at their shows. <laughs> <laughs> but he is he is an amazing guitar player. Absolutely amazing. Wow, James cool. Is. Well, thanks, James. Um, thanks for being here and, and checking out the show. Uh, what year would that have been? Like Pale Divine? What what era was this? James. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, I started playing with. I, I we were originally called the Eyes, and I think uh, okay. we started probably eighty two, eighty three. It's like okay, yeah, fourteen, fifteen, yeah. It's fun, man. Great yeah. era for playing rock and roll in a band. Totally. So uh, T Top. 94 <laughs> White Falcon, he says. Can uh -huh. you recommend a good value treble bleed? Do you use treble bleed on your I do. And uh 
um, our mutual friend over at Lush Guitars, Eric, um, yeah. does a treble bleed circuit for me, and I don't remember what the value is on that. Um, hmm. You could hit up Eric though at Lush Guitars. You talk. Yeah, yeah. He He's, won't tell um, you, but he he won't tell you, but you can ask him. Yeah, he not. You got to take your guitar there. Get him to do it. <laughs> he seals it what, and then pocks it. Whatever the sir value is, I find really natural. Like so natural, I don't think about it. So whatever they came up with is works for me. If it's a cap and a resistor, but... it's yeah. But we've been through quite a few different ones before finding yeah. the right value. And I know that's what I used on the signature Gretsch. Okay, cool. Um, was yeah, that same value. Uh, JN is up there in the super duper chat and he's up in Canada somewhere. He says, great discussion. Do you have a go? Oh, I was going to ask you this as well. He says, do you have a go-to speaker you like to use? Greenbacks mm. or V3s? <laughs> the two rock and roll speakers. No, I don't know. I love, man, I'll tell you what, those Alnico creams, Celestian, yeah. are amazing. It, okay. I had, I've, I've had this uh, one, it's a low powered Tweed Twin. And I've okay. had it for years, and it was always okay. You know, original Jensen's, and you know, at the P, the what was it thirteen, P twelve, something P twelve, yeah. one of those, and it was always okay, man. Right. And I, I put Alnico creams. Oh my god, that amp is become one of my favorite amps now. Isn't that amazing? Like yeah. that, that it's why I'm not really a Jensen or other speakers person. It's like whenever you do that and you put a celestial, you go, oh, sounds so much better. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. That's a um, thing. Live, I use G12H 65s and Alnico Golds in an X pattern. And I oh, use okay. the cream. I use the Alnico cream in my Supro. Okay. Have you tried the Al Alnico creams in like a 412 or anything? Uh, I have, and I, I they, it, it doesn't give me what I want out from, from my live rig, at least, you know, um, better for a combo though, maybe I think, yeah, okay. that's been my experience. Interesting. Um, but man, yeah, I'm with you on Jensen's except for 10 inch, like in a basement. Okay. Man, it's just you because a, a lot of the tweeters they were underpowered. The speakers were, or the overpowered. The speakers were not able to keep up with the amps, mm -hmm. so they sort of fart out, and that's why putting a Celestian in them really. I see. Yeah, you know, makes them come alive for me sometimes. But in, sometimes. in a four ten, there was enough um, it, dissipation or whatever through the. Uh, yeah, there's something, there's just something so creamy about base, you know, about the 10 inch Jensen that it works for me. So, having said that, have you tried uh, like the G10 Gold or any of those in a basement? Uh, uh, yes. Did, and I and went back to the Jensen's. You did. Okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I love that speaker. So, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that actually the 10 inch Greenback a lot too. It's a mm -hmm. cool speaker. Yeah. Interesting. I don't speaker. have anything with a green back 10 right now. Um, you, I was going to ask you like how you feel about old, like G 12 M versus what they make now or, you know, the old cab. Um, speaker. you know, I love, yeah, I mean, it's so hard to beat a vintage Celestian, you know? Yeah. And they're making great stuff. A, a lot of their speakers now have to break in. Mm. You know, they've got to settle in. But the creams do not. The Alnico creams sound good right out of the box. Okay. That's been my experience. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I love their speakers, and I love, like, new speakers, great, cool. And then there's always something where it, I, I equate it to, like, similar to when you listen to an ACDC record on on a turntable on vinyl, you know, when maybe you've been listening to that's what listening to an old Marshall cabinet for me is like, sometimes you go, Oh, <laughs> there it is. Like, that's uh, just, there's just something about it. That's just a tier above when it's a great seventies cab. Yeah. You know, so you're a seventies 
cab guy? Kind of. So I mean, gray I, backs or uh, my main cab has black backs. Um, black backs. Okay. Seventy-five hertz black backs. I've got two cabs actually: a B cab and an A cab that both have loaded with old black backs. One's an original cab and one's a repro. Um, and in the repro, that's my B cab. It's a blockhead cab, but it, yeah, it's all old. 75 hertz but i've got one 55 hertz green back in there too which mm -hmm. is a cool sound i find like the bass cone i have okay so my number one cab that i is generally my go-to has 55 hertz. 55 the, the, but but they're but they're mislabeled oh really yeah did you just figure yeah. it out by looking go wait a minute that's a heavy magnet that's not there uh, or something Obed. or uh oh he, my buddy obed looked at it and goes man that's that cone is a 55 not the cone sorry yeah it's a 50 oh, that's interesting and, wow so they missed, and so they it was, but it was labeled uh, it was wow. mislabeled that's so yeah. weird so you liked it and you're like i don't know this just sounds better and yes oh, yeah why? and it's a it's a basket weave um cab you know but it's tore up i've got and then yeah. i've got uh a, a 70s the um checkerboard cab with grays that is my favorite 70s cab and they're very different sounding right and then i've also got an orange uh an old 73 mm -hmm. orange cab and man that thing sounds completely different than the yeah because you know they're thicker and they're it has that like yeah. that low mid-range thump that's just wow unique to orange cabs high watch too I've got an old high watt, uh, 70s high watt cab with fanes. With fanes, yeah. Even loading them, I was going to say with Celestians, which a friend of mine used to do in the 80s because uh, they've got that oh, port really? at the bottom. Yeah, like yeah, he used to yeah. do way before this was a thing. He was mixing old G12Ms with G12Hs in the bottom and mm -hmm. in the high watt cab at the port and playing them with like kind of Marshall style amps. And his tone was unbelievable. And that's right. Where I he was like, yeah, this is, these cabs are better than the Marshall cabs. They sound bigger. And I think it's the port, you know? And so huh. it was interesting. interesting. But yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's interesting. I don't, I, I don't have a ton of experience with like the different old cabs. I don't own, but I've got, like I say, a couple of these and it's mostly the black backs that I've gravitated towards because they're a little clearer or so they're a little more, I don't know, I guess Celestian I, chain. Didn't they have like a fire or something I heard? And like, the yes. old yeah, 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 sure. In 73 or something. Right. 73. Yeah. Yeah, so then they changed then or whatever. It changed, but right. There's a cabinet. But yeah, the the oh, uh, the the black backs are yeah the seventies. I know what you mean about that. They're more um, there's the basket cabs and those early speakers are very mid focused. You know, they're very they have a thing about them though that's but as far as like a big broad sound, you know, the seventies cabs of the shit. Yeah, big 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 sound. Um, yeah. I was going to say that there's a, there's a cab at line six because uh, they've got this great collection of old amps out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I guess they use for their, you know, modeling purposes and stuff, but they've got this cab loaded with like, it's from 66 or something and it's 20 watt greenbacks in it. It's the original. And that cabinet is one of the best cabinets I've ever heard in my life. It sounds in kind of the, it's so creamy sounding and just sounds like, I mean, you can plug a bright aggressive amp into it and it just chills it out in a way that's like amazing, you know, where it's right. Right. You know, but they wouldn't let me play very loud through it. <laughs> and I was like, no, I get it. You want me to blow up your, your prized cabinet, but um, it's a terrific sounding cabinet. Really, really good. Oh, Friedman's here. Dave says, hi. Uh -oh. Hey Dave. <laughs> He's a man of few words, but a good man. <laughs> we love Dave. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I wish someone would build me an 82 to 84 Fender Super Champs as SD design. You know, I just saw a friend of mine doing a video for a new Rivera amp that is supposedly like the mods that Paul was doing on everybody's Fenders and stuff in the late 70s. So, well, he did, he designed the Super Champ. Right. Um, and yeah. always said that that was his favorite amp that he designed i have one in the other room and i use uh i used that for years as my main like sort of go-to solo amp you know lead amp yeah yeah because it, it, it's just so singy and you run that through a 412 and really it's just oh god it's a beast that's cool wow yeah i'm actually i was thinking about selling it but i don't i don't know <laughs> you gotta get that burst <laughs> i know man <laughs> yeah so yeah so is that a guitar really want one <laughs> yeah is that a guitar that they're like uh 
you're like, just give me a minute. I'm don't sell that guitar. <laughs> it's one of those I things. I put a deposit you... down on it, and uh, and uh, now I'm I've been inventorying for the last month and dealing with. Uh, I'm going to sell everything through uh, Chicago Music Exchange. Oh, okay. Um, they're good friends of mine. The owner's a good friend of mine, and uh, so yeah, I'm going to sell. I mean, I'm selling a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, it's good to know. I mean, so for folks watching, go to the Chicago Music Exchange site, or you know, send them an email or something, and get the yeah, list. or follow me on Instagram, and I'll I'm going to be announcing. There you go. Oh, this that. reminds me, we've got a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I almost forgot. Um, uh, Franklin Vanderbilt. Uh, oh yeah. I, we we played on the right. same song. You and I are on the same track, I think. Yeah, I just uh, I just did that. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. played on it, man. Your part sounds great on that. He sent me a few songs oh, that you played on. They sound great. Oh, thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Yeah, I I can't. I'm not sure what the tune is. I gotta. He he just mentioned that he uh, that 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 you were playing on the track. So we giving him a shout out. Franklin is uh is awesome. He's he's a uh, uh, songwriter and singer now, and also longtime drummer for Lenny Kravitz. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's doing his own project, so uh, he's you know something that I got to record on this year, and 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 Richard as well. It's pretty cool. So I can't wait. God, to hear what it. a great drummer! Oh man, so go so cool, and just such a cool dude. <laughs> he's like an amazing yeah. guy. Very you know? cool guy. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be that'll be great to hear. Oh, uh, well, let's see what else we got. We've been going almost. Uh, we're at one forty-one. I got. It's probably almost time to go. I would think, but uh, this has been awesome. Maybe I'll just take a couple more couple more questions here uh and then we can we can split and but this is, this is amazing 817 people online so thank you guys all for being here we we appreciate it yeah thank you uh q stick saying that that you inspired him to use your fingers more than just to pick what got you started hybrid picking um jeff back cool. <laughs> i mean yeah the, yeah yeah uh, Jeff Beck, and also, you know, I uh, like I was talking about, I I studied classical as a kid, so my right hand was sort of already together. And then also, I had an obsession with country players, you know, like Danny Gatton, and um, really got into that. And that, you know, you can't do that with a pick. I, I don't do the hybrid thing like you do, like w where you're holding your pick, and I tuck my pick. So, oh. you know, I'm. Like, sorry, I'm here. Um, I always go like that, and then I use these fingers. Oh, and I I keep it tucked. I just that's I can't do the pick and the fingers thing. I'd, so so you'll use your okay. So so, so you I tuck, tuck your, the pick you, away. Yeah, but you can still use your thumb with the pick kind of out of the way. Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so cool. it's just it's just these. Oh, I see. In your first finger, how interesting! I've never done E M and A. So. Yeah. Okay, I gotta give that a try. After that's interesting. That's cool. And so, do you use use all all three? Like you use your pinky as well, even. When you're right. Doing this. Right. Oh, yeah, how cool! That's fascinating. But a lot of times, like in the studio, I just won't. A lot of times, I won't use a pick, or even live, I'll drop. I'll just drop my pick and play with my right. fingers. Do the but there's so, I, I, there's something really. Um, it, it, I don't. It, it's more personal I, I i don't know you know what yeah. i mean like oh totally you, w with a pick it's more homogenized like it, it's it's sort of more two-dimensional not three-dimensional you know with your fingers you you can snap you can just barely touch it it's just that's it's just very expressive i find a whole range of sounds there that and like yeah mm. like everything from the dynamic and the, and the timbre of the you know the note, everything. I mean, just yeah, Jeff Beck. He's the perfect example. It's. it's I mean, cool. really. I mean, that's that's really where I was like, okay, I got to get yeah. this together. Yeah. So much tone. I mean, it picks great for all kinds of things, but then there's just so much color there that that if you yeah, if you've I never do, done I it, do need to use a pick. You know, I have to. You yeah. Can do some stuff where I can't with just my fingers. Sure, and it's it's great to you know to to yeah, I, I remember reading about uh, Warren D. Martini going on because uh, he started doing a lot of stuff with his fingers towards the late '80s, and uh, 
and he said he went on a vacation to Hawaii and he had a guitar, but he forgot to bring a pick. <laughs> so he just played like for a couple of weeks with no pick. And then he had this, he's like, Oh, this is cool. <laughs> you know, right. And right. You discover all these, all these sounds. Oh, a bunch of super chats just came in. Adam says, thanks for all the speaker info regarding the Alnico cream impressions on how it compares or is different to greenback or cream back. Uh, these things are a lot of money. Uh, thank you. Always learn something new. Um, you know, look, you this think? is the deal. I mean, I'm going to be honest. We have the uh, uh, we have the luxury of trying out everything, right? You know, I right. mean, when, and and so a company will send you one of everything that you can try and you experiment. And in my situation, I have an engineer who I totally trust, our our front house engineer. That when we're in rehearsals, we we he's listening in another room through reference monitors, and we can really dial things in. And you really we're listening under a microscope because we're in a, on in ears, so mm. it, you know everything is is really magnified, right? As far as the detail and the nuances and the the subtle changes in tone, you know, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, and it's, and then in the it's venue, it's also brutal because it's so unforgiving, right? Oh God! I was going to ask you. I mean, you're probably on ears, right? On ears. Yeah, man. I'll tell you what. Um, I did a tour with uh, Thin Lizzy a, a while back, um, where I joined them for a year, and man, not being on ears <laughs> was pretty fun. Yeah, because you, you you know you don't have to be so when you're. It, you're listening to a microphone that's inches from your speaker, you know, yep. and it's in your head. You're not hearing the room. You're not hearing. So it's very unforgiving. So it, it takes a while to acclimate to that because it's so exact, right? How, yeah, it's disconcerting it, and kind of makes me, I feel like I don't play as well on in yours, to be honest, because I'm a little more timid. You know. uh, well, yeah, I get that. I mean, I've been doing it for so long, I guess, because even, I mean, going back to, uh, I guess the first, I mean, I remember with the furs, with Psychedelic Furs, um, and maybe even Love Spit Love, we were on years. And, okay. and uh, I did a tour with um, BT, I was on in years. Uh, Enrique Iglesias, I was on in years. And like you, you hear, it takes a while to get used to it. Yeah. But um, man, yeah. coming off of it doesn't take any getting used to. Exactly. It's like well, because it's, you, can be, you can be sloppy. You cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I like to not hear myself that well because I'm play freer. I, you know? I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. It's so great. Like sometimes I can't hear myself at all. I'll walk away from the amp and be like. You know, and I'm just like, yeah, I know I got I'm basically I got this covered. I know I'm doing the right thing, but I can't I'm listening to the PA and the crowd and I'm in the moment a little bit more. Right. When it's right. this thing, I mean just stick your fingers in your ear right now, everybody out there. <laughs> you know, when you do this and then you know, there's a crowd, it's it's that just that is weird. It's like being underwater all of a sudden or something. Yeah. Weird, you know, it is. Yeah. I don't know. It's strange. Um and the thing that is the the di most difficult transition for me was always when I'm walking to the thing where I used to be able to walk towards the drums to get a little more hat and hear my amp a little less. And you naturally mix yourself by moving around the stage right, and kind of right. like you just, and not only that, the connection with the musicians where you can talk to one another. I remember seeing right. it. I yeah. was in, I was playing with Melissa Etheridge and I remember the bass player talking to the drummer once and saying like, Say, yelling something at him, some, some like, Oh, you know, fu some funny thing that happened on the gig. And the drummer goes, I can't hear you. <laughs> you know? And I thought, in that moment, I was like, that's the problem. Like, we, we lose this connection with one another on stage. But by the same token, when you're doing a stadium and you got, you know, 200 yard ego ramps going out on the front, you got to use it. Right. One. So, yeah. And they're great. In that. Right. Right. It's, yeah. I can run And away it makes you tighter. It makes everything so much tight, tighter yeah. as far as you, because I've got slash in one ear and I'm in the other ear and then I've got duff in the middle and the kick drum and this, you know, so it's like, you can really lock in when you do that. You're staged right. Um, yeah. Do you have yourself in your right ear and slash in the in my left ear? 
Okay. That would, that's, that's really interesting. I'm one of those people that like, I always want to hear the part that is the, like, if it's me or whatever, I want to hear it in my left ear and I'm lucky to be stage left a lot of the time. Cause I can do it, it, but it'd be weird to reverse that. I think in the years, if I was stage right, you know what I mean? Huh. So, like I, I, maybe my left I, ear works better or something. I don't know. Really? Cause my right ear is much better. I'm my oh. left ear because I used to in playing clubs, Mm. You know, we play four or five sets a night, you know, and I had a, I had a 212 Marshall cab mm. off to my left. It would point up at me. And so, that's, yeah. so my left ear is uh, down quite a bit. I guess this is the other good thing about ears is that you can control that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and get Yeah. A little, yeah. Right. Like the uh, to kind of abate the, you know, that, that's the one thing. I mean, I think overall for there's there's been a number of gigs i've done where just because of my placement on stage and the one of the last tours i did i was right in front of the drums um and it's just like there's no way i couldn't i'm literally like you know like two three feet behind me as a crash symbol you know i would kill him kill me you know no, yeah can't deal with that <laughs> not at my age trevor uh, uh says yeah. thank you pete and richard as well as vincent uh up there in the uh the super chat lou as well and adam all you guys so cool uh and uh thanks for doing the the, the super chat we really appreciate it i uh, adam had that question about the speakers the alnico or adam yeah about the alnico uh, cream i would say that the main difference just coming back to that for a second the alnico thing it's always got there's a, there's a mid-range kind of compression to it that sounds a little different than a ceramic magnet speaker that's always a little more to me not scooped but maybe maybe it's just like a bit more of a prominent mid-range in a really cool way in an alico speaker that i always mm -hmm. hear in that kind of compression of the whatever with that style of magnet that's yeah i agree with that friendly for some amps you know yeah and a huge yeah. part of the vox sound you know so one thing about the matchlesses and uh what you know it, those amps that came out in the 90s a lot of uh, i don't i don't even know if the blue was out then i guess it maybe it was but a lot of those companies Top Hat was, I, I had a Top Hat King Royale, the great AC30. I actually have another one here now ahead, but that amp had a, it had ceramic speakers in it and the matchlesses, I think they had ceramic, maybe G12H30 or something. I always yeah. felt like that's just not to me the right, I would, I would have to put, you know, golds or blues or something in an amp like that for, for yeah. me. But, um, so the cream just does that really well, I think. Um, yeah, Vincent, was just asking uh, up there in the super chat, any advice for how to take advantage of owning a large amount of gear, but feeling overwhelmed with where to begin using it? It's a good question. I mean, like, ends uh, up staring at <laughs> Like when you, did you ever feel guilty because you look at a guitar and it's such a cool guitar and I haven't picked it up in eight months? <laughs> that whole thing. You know? Yeah, that's why I'm selling a lot of them. Because, you know, I, I buy stuff and... You know, there's a lot of stuff that I own that I just haven't used on any recordings or any, you know. I, yeah. I, 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 and I think that's why I'm paring down now. If you can consolidate that into a burst, that's like a guitar right. that will be a right. great tool. Yeah. We, this is and, how we justify things. And it's, it, <laughs> it's yeah, but it's, it's also an investment. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, that's that's all this is i mean money in the bank a, don't you have a scala yeah okay you're not gonna get any better than that <laughs> it's like yeah it's, i gotta show you mine because okay literally when you got yours leo came by my studio in santa monica and showed me that guitar and he was taking it to you next i believe we're sending it to you and so then yeah. i got i was like this is so cool they're and amazing me, it's so good he made me this and I, I got it the day before I went on tour in Japan for like, you know, the whole summer. And I just sent it in my guitar vault. I didn't even get to play it. I was like, okay, I'll just, I'm going to take it. It became my main guitar on that gig. It's just so yeah. good. And yep. the neck and the, I don't know if you feel this way about that. We're talking about this is a Leo Scala uh, underdog is what this guitar is. And he's a, he's in LA and he's an amazing luthier. That's kind of an, he's a real artist. He really is. He's a, mad scientist show show them what makes it special though oh with the top so right. vented top you can see the gap in between the top and the body so, so i don't even know how hollow it's it chambered. is chambered it's chambered but it, it it only so the maple connects to the mahogany in key spots mm -hmm. 
it, it's really interesting his whole approach but man they just sound phenomenal they, they're just they yeah. feel it's he's the only cat that like makes guitars that feel like an old instrument right i mean it feel it has mojo like yeah. like an old guitar right it really I, does I, um I have one here. Oh, dude, cool. Oh, great. You've got, yeah, those, see, his guitars, they're like art. I mean, the, Again, if you look at all the metal a, work. It's, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a uh, flame maple top that he painted over, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. And then uh, it's also vented. And again, this is a telly, but it's, uh, and it's got two um, flat old uh, Esquire type. Or no caster pickups, bridge pickups. It's got two Would bridge be, pickups. Oh, two bridge pickups. Would those yeah. be arcane? Or these are arcanes, yeah. Now he's oh. making his own pickups now. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah, he's he has gone on this quest. Uh, he bought winders and now he's making, of course, the most ridiculous humbuckers ever. Wow. Cool. Yeah. I gotta get in touch with him again. And say hi. I haven't talked to him for a long time. I I agree though the necks and everything. Have him send you, have him send you a set of his new humbuckers for that guitar. Okay, yeah, this has their canes that I think are kind of Alnico two PAFE situation. Right, but, uh, right. Love right. to try them. Um, I felt like when I got this because it's got the big frets and all the you know mm -hmm. I grew up in the eighties, so it's like I liked sixty one hundreds and big frets, yep. and, I, and this guitar just felt to me. Especially on a big on the you know the arena tour I was doing in Japan, big stages and stuff like it was so, like I could grip the neck and my hand was just glued to the neck with the big frets yeah. and the way that he, you know, and so it just became my main instrument that year. But um, really, really fun he, guitar. Man, his attention to detail is second to none, for sure. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a good dude. Leo Scala, check him out. Check him out, folks, for sure. I'm just gonna look. I screenshot a couple comments i don't want to miss anybody and then we should probably run i'll let you go uh ryan casey up there in the top chat in the super chat and trevor i think i mentioned trevor i might have already mentioned these uh if i missed anybody i'm really really sorry sometimes i get blue sometimes i get some folks at the, in the super chat and i miss their comment and i'm really sorry <laughs> don't be mad <laughs> i apologize uh this this has been amazing. We got to do this again sometime. Geek out. I would love to. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Actually, next time in LA, I'm going to bug you to go get coffee. Oh, please, please, please. Yeah, if you're coming out anytime, uh, I'd love to hang. We'll go get a meal or something. And God, I hope I'm going to be there soon. I know, right? When are we going to get like past this? I don't know. What's your? F I know none of us know, but what's your feel? What do you? <laughs> what do you think? Um, like shows. Moving I, forward, I, I, you know, we've you know. got shows booked this summer still in Europe, but I, I don't know. Right. I don't think that's going to happen. I'm yeah. hoping by end of summer, we'll be able to do shows in the U S okay. Cause man, things are happening now. I, I, I have to admit something. I got a uh, vaccine yesterday. Oh, good. I drove for four hours to Bumfuck, Missouri, which is uh, <laughs> the northern west part of the state, and uh, it, there, my my wife had been stalking all the counties mm. and looking at their vaccine supplies that they were getting. Right, so this one county got two thousand vaccines, and there's only twelve hundred people in the county. Oh wow! Now, of those twelve hundred people. Driving up there, I learned that most of them. Now we drove four hours each way, so we wow. drove. We were, we were like, and we had no idea if it was going to work. We we're like, screw it, let's take the chance. I mean, I, I don't. I've got to do tra I've got to travel this next month. You know, I've got to go to Chicago. I've got to go to New York. Uh, I've got to go to Texas to do an album. So uh, I'm, I'm dying to get this vaccine. Yeah. Um, so it was worth it for me to, to take the chance and we got up there and there was nobody there. And on the way there, we saw all these, nothing but Trump signs and, uh, Confederate flags and stuff. Okay. And, and you know, a lot of those people aren't, they're not going to get vaccinated and there was I, nobody you know, there. There was nobody it's, there. It's so unfortunate that it's. It's a politicized thing because it's we've been vaccinating and you know polio and all kinds of things forever. I'll tell you when I when I became an American, uh, well actually it was when I got my green card, 
just to come just so I've been living in the States on visas and stuff forever. Cause I'm Canadian mm -hmm. originally. Uh, I and I had to get they the government in order to be, get my green card uh, made me get like, I think it was five vaccines, <laughs> at least four in one day. Like I got them all at one medical appointment and they, they x-rayed me for uh, tuberculosis to make sure I didn't have wow. TB. I'm like if I got tuberculosis, I got it in the U.S. and you're telling me if I have it now, you're going to kick me out. <laughs> you gave right, it to right. me. <laughs> but anyway, but I, mean, I got. You know, when you go to South America, you got. You know, when you go to some countries, right. you need yellow fever shots. You need. You know, that you you got to get vaccinated for whatever. That's the thing. So, well, it's folks like you. I mean, you got it. How you feel? You're maybe a little sore in the arm, and that's it, right? I would think. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. I, it was like the greatest day. <laughs> so <laughs> Good, we man. were so excited. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, we've been, I mean, God, just the, the chance to get through all this and move on and play show, because that's really going to be the thing. I mean, uh, I'm of the mind where yeah. it's like, hey, if we get these vaccines, let's get back and do some gigs. And like, you know, I'm like, I don't know if it's that's the plan or not, but if it means wearing masks or whatever, let's do it. We'll wear, we'll wear yeah. the mask. Let's have some shows and everybody, you know, and, you know, it's it's like we just need to move on from this because I've been I don't know about you, but. I've been pretty good through the whole thing and I'm really fortunate to have work here at the studio and stuff. But the last few days have been a little weighing on me. Like just the, the, uh, really like everybody, just like emotionally, uh, like uh, I just get it. You know where you have those moments where you're like, I'm really tired of this. Like, mm -hmm. and, yeah. Where it's like, I just yeah. want to like life has become so small, uh, yeah. with, you know, and it's amazing. I mean, I'm not, it's not a complaint. It's just an observation about coming back and forth here from home to the studio and uh, just only human that I need. I bought a bike and that's been helping because I get out and ride. I go to Santa Monica. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a runner, so I'm out running uh, every day. I go running every day. It's like necessary, right? Like to get uh, yeah, out. There. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it is recently becoming more and more fatiguing. Just a little, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm feeling it. Cool. But man, do it does it does feel like we're there's a light now, you know, at the end of yeah. the tunnel. So what? I'm excited about that. I, I mean, for me, I, I mean, yesterday it felt like a hundred pound weight lifted from my shoulders. You know, that's awesome. And yesterday, I believe, was a record set for. I think it was two point four million. Oh, is that right? I didn't see. Yes. Yeah, vaccine, and I think the day before was two point three, so it was two records in a row. So we're it's getting better and better. Yeah, and better with, yeah. Um, but you know, this, this thing that we went to, um, they like I said, there was nobody there, and they were like, uh, and they said, "What tier are you?" And we're like, "Well, we're we're the last tier. We're tier three. And they're like, "It it doesn't matter because we got so many. We're trying to get rid. They're like, "Call your friends." And like, well, oh. we drove four hours. There's not enough time. And they, we were watching their Facebook page, and they kept it open. They kept expect. They're saying, "Okay, well, we're going to stay open till six. We're going to stay open till seven. And they stayed open oh, wow. till eight, you know. And it was the National Guard there doing. It's and they, I'm sure they threw away a ton yeah. of vaccines, you know. And right. it sucks. It's just, it, yeah. I yeah. mean, we're, we're. I think the country's figuring it out, and we're, uh, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, like this is the thing that we're going to get through. And then, well, hope I hope you're right. I hope it's fall, you know, at the latest before something starts happening. Man, I'm see. still hoping end of summer in the U.S. Because we got dates yeah. booked end of summer here, you know, after Europe here. And then and, we go to Australia, which in depth, I mean, Australia is already doing shows. Right. That's And that's the thing that I've said, like, if you're in a band or whatever, like, why not? To do production rehearsals go to us do play everywhere you can play in australia and new zealand if they'll let you in you know if you can get down there and do whatever the protocol is for you know the right. <laughs> vaccines or or you know two weeks of you know staying isolated or whatever it is but it would be great to go. yeah i see the you know the the videos and everything from down there of people playing shows and out having a good time yep. and yeah so we'll get there i hear i think uk is pretty far along with vaccinations too like i heard it uk like is yeah they're they're talking about uh given the green light for some festivals this summer. So, I wow. mean, who knows? I'm, we might be, be awesome. Be awesome. But yeah. I know other European countries are not doing as well. So, Right. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll end on a positive note. Let's, uh, let's, that's amazing you got that. And uh, congratulations. And Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, having me. I really appreciate it. And I would love to do this again.
Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks to everybody that did the, uh, the the super chat and all you, just everybody that comes every week and hangs out. I really appreciate all you guys for for coming and hanging. And uh, this is terrific. Next week, it'll be me here, just little old me, and then uh, Richie Kotzen's coming on in two weeks, which is he's got a new record out with uh, uh, Adrian Smith. So that's pretty exciting, and uh, sounds really cool. So it'll be fun to chat with him uh so hang out for a second and i'll say i'll say goodbye to you proper but i'll end the i'll end the show now everybody take care have a great week i'll see you next time